Hey, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. In this episode, I'm going to be talking with my friend Nick Dagan Best, and we're going to be talking about the emergence of artificial intelligence and the idea of artificial general intelligence and some of the implications for that you know, in the coming decades. Uh, so, hey, Nick, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Chris. So today, for those that like the data, it's Sunday, May 7th, 2023, starting at uh, 11.45 a.m. in Denver, Colorado, and this is actually the 400th episode of the show. So um, this is actually a big milestone, and Nick, you were one of my very first guests on one of the very first episodes of the Astrology Podcast, so I thought it would be great to have you back again uh, for this milestone and do something a little bit different, like in past milestones, every time I hit 100, I'll sometimes do a retrospective of some sort, but in this one, I want to switch things up and instead look forward into the future because it seems like we're at a very important time period with the emergence of some of these technologies over the past several months. And so I wanted to document that and also talk a little bit about where that's heading in the future. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks. Congratulations. Uh, 400 already. That's amazing. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you for having me participate in this special edition of the Astrology Podcast. Yeah, our very first episode together where you were like my one of my first guests was episode three on the mm -hmm. definition of what it means to be an astrologer or what constitutes an astrologer way back in 2012. 2012, 11 years ago. Crazy. Yeah. So that's why I thought it would be good to do this as like a prospective episode instead of retrospective since, you know, way back then I was laying a foundation. And if you look to the very first, listen to the very first episode of the astrology podcast, like I had a vision for like what I wanted to accomplish and it's been surprising how much of that I've actually been able to accomplish over the past decade, just methodically going through all the different topics and exploring all the different areas of astrology that I wanted to explore. Um, so that's why I thought it would be good in this episode to talk about some of the technology things that are going on and also look at some transits in order to try to talk about the question of like what is happening now, what does the next decade or two look like? And what are the things, some of the things coming up in the future in order to then, you know, set a template for what's coming up over the next decade or two? Yeah. Yeah. This is a great topic for an episode. All right. So Moving forward. Yeah. All right. So um, I've already done about a year ago, I did an episode on artificial intelligence and astrology with Kent Bai in episode 335, which was just titled Artificial Intelligence and Astrology. But since so much has happened since that time, that was, I think, December of 2021 when we recorded that, um, so much has happened, especially over the past six months, that I thought it would be good for an update, um, partially to document some of the things that are happening now and also to talk about where things are headed in the future. So the three primary things I want to cover in this episode are, um, one, some of the different ways that astrologers could use AI or that it could become relevant to the practice of astrology in the, the near and not too distant future. Uh, number two, some of the current and future transits that are relevant to the emergence of artificial intelligence, both now and in the uh, not too distant future in this decade. And then three, I wanted to talk about um, some philosophical issues that are arising from the concept of AI and that people are talking about that could be relevant in terms of where things are headed in the future and what directions things might take, since that's also going to be relevant very much to help us contextualize some of the large astrological transits and the outer planet things that are coming up in the future. So if we understand some of the possibilities, then we may have a better chance of actually forecasting some of the actual outcomes of, of what takes place in the future. Uh, I think, which makes sort of sense. It's always good to have like context when you're making predictions, I think, right? Yeah, <clears throat> it's part of the it's part of the process. I mean, being able to sort of spot the patterns, uh, see how patterns have been established and and work at a um, some kind of thesis as to how that pattern will sort of continue to play itself out. Right. Yeah, and both of you and I are primarily astrologers rather than people that are, have a background in art, artificial intelligence. Yeah. Um, so that's primarily where we're coming from, but hopefully that can be useful to some people and we might be able to add something new to many of the discussions that are taking place today. 
So um, one of the things I wanted to do also is set the context for where we're at currently and what's happened over the past six months, where there's been this explosion of AI ever since November and December, or really since late last year. So um, I meant to, I almost did an episode in December when ChatGPT was first released and all this stuff with AI was sort of unleashed and started becoming much more mainstream, but I ended up not doing it and putting it off. So I'm partially want to do this episode in order to catch up and document some of the things that have been happening, since I think they're going to be really important to understand how some of the current transits in the sky right now are correlating with and are describing the things that are happening that we're actually seeing in real time, especially since some of these transits, like for example, Pluto, which just went into Aquarius in March of 2023, that's the beginning of a of a 20 year transit that's going to last until the early 2040s. So it's really important for us to to recognize and to truly see what some of the important trends are that are beginning now, because those are going to just get more and more imp important in the future, the further into that transit we get over the next 20 years, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a big sort of threshold to cross whenever uh, Pluto enters a new tropical sign. It tends to be a real visible sort of shift in the epoch in the era um, that that you know we're we're in, uh, um, just immediate sort of cultural and zeitgeist changes that are really identifiable. And uh, in this case, yeah, like just as Pluto was going into uh, Aquarius, um, you know, we we got the uh, GPT four, which added uh, that was just in March, the same month that the ingress happened, um, and that's when I mean Chat GP was already you know, a phenomenon in itself when it was released last November of 2022. Right. Yeah, let's talk, uh, but, let's talk about that. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's there's been sort of an arc leading up to uh, the Pluto ingress in Aquarius coinciding with uh, the release of GPT-4. Right. Yeah. So, um, so the big thing that happened where all this started was on November 30th of 2022, um, a company named OpenAI released... Um, a program to the public called Chat GPT. Um, and let me share the chart. We don't have like a time chart for this. So I'm just setting it as a noon chart in Denver, but this gives you the general alignment of the planets. Um, and one of the things that was really notable is just there's a pretty close T square in this chart where you have, on the one hand, the Jupiter Neptune conjunction at 22 and 28 Pisces with Jupiter at 28 Pisces. And then you have um, Venus and the Sun and Mercury over in Sagittarius squaring that conjunction. And you have Mars, which was retrograde in Gemini, um, opposing the Sagittarius planets and squaring the uh, Jupiter and Neptune conjunction. Mm -hmm. At the same time, this was also the, the tail end of Saturn and Aquarius because Saturn is at 19 degrees of Aquarius in this chart and it was on its way out of that sign. So it was sort of finishing up um, a transit where it had been moving through Aquarius since early 2020. And sometimes by the time a planet gets to the end of the sign, you start seeing some of the final results of things that had been building up for a while. And one of the things that had been building up over the past three years was this company, OpenAI, had been working on their, um, their internal sort of uh, AI artificial intelligence program and then they released a public facing version with an interface called ChatGPT. And all of a sudden, um, this thing was so impressive that it just exploded in popularity. And it became one of the, um, what was it? It was like the fastest growing. Um, it's the fastest app. growing app in the history of the internet uh, is, is the, the reckoning now. Yeah. Yeah. The fastest growing consumer application in history with a um, hundred million monthly active users just in January, just two months after yeah. launch. So that's huge. I mean, that's a huge turning point, both in terms of sort of adoption of something, but also part of the reason it was adopted so fastly, so quickly is just that it was pretty impressive. It could do some pretty cool stuff where people hadn't had that experience before of interacting with um, an AI that seemed pretty good at um, understanding what was asked of it and then being able to give responses or do things that were actually beyond the capabilities of things that we had seen or experienced like that before. 
yeah uh that's just it and and um, i mean nothing is has accelerated so quickly let alone on such a huge scale so it, it really is remarkable and and uh, yeah, set the tone for more recent events that that are happening now as of the the ingress. Right. Uh, so, hmm. go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say March was the month uh, first of Saturn's ingress into Pisces, and then later in the month of, uh, as we were saying, Pluto's ingress into Aquarius. Um, yeah. So in that same month, we had. But let's uh, hold on. Like, oh, I don't okay. want to jump forward that quick. I really want to dwell oh, okay. on the release because. It was the release initially, like that was already mind blowing, like for a lot of people, and that already changed the game because suddenly, you know, um, the concept of artificial intelligence, which seemed very far off, the, this idea of like a sentient AI, while right. this was while this was not that, it could still do some pretty um, incredible things. Like, what are some of the things that it did, or what are some of the ways that you started playing with it? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> um, I mean, it can, it can, you know, do these sort of creative writing things. So I, I haven't really sort of taken it too far with that, although I've been, I have been, you know, toying with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's been more the, the sort of, uh, um, the back end and, and, uh, uh, you know, learning, learning about how it got to this place and sort of getting a, trying to get a handle on, on what the next step can be. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's just, there's, you know, there's, there's, uh, it, it sort of absorbs the knowledge of the internet and, you know, it apparently is helping students write their papers quicker, but also helping their teachers, uh, grade the papers quicker and that kind of thing. Yeah. So, and this was apparently based on, um, a breakthrough that had occurred that Google actually, some uh, researchers at Google um, published a paper in 2017 with this new development called Transformers. And this led to the development of what's called large language models, yeah. um, which is like the approach to AI in the direction that things started heading in 2017 that was like a major turning point and an advancement. And then very quickly after that, other companies besides Google, like this company OpenAI, started working with this and developing um, things like their GPT AI, which eventually led to, to ChatGPT. And when they released ChatGPT in on November 30th of, of 2022, um, it was based on version 3.5 of their GPT yeah. artificial intelligence program. Yeah. And transformer is the T in GPT. I mean, this was the sort of the, the, the basis that the uh, introduction of this sort of this uh, transformer uh, um, ability uh, and the idea of, of sort of stacking transformers on top of each other, which is what, what my understanding of what these different, uh, you know, GPT one to two to three to 3.5 to four, what these advancements have involved is sort of, uh, um, you know, stacking these transformers on top of each other. But yeah, the transformer is the T in GPT. Um, right. I forget the total acronym, but uh, yeah, that's that's basically the the progress that we've made in the last five years is is revolved around that, and that's how we've got gotten to this point. Right, and then at the same time, like late last year, we started to see major advancements with um, some of the image AI technologies that could generate different images like Midjourney or Dolly or Lenza also exploded in popularity around the same time in early December, yeah. uh, which was interesting how that coincided with the release also of ChatGPT, even though they were not related. Um, and just people starting to be able to use AI to create um, both artistic images, but also sometimes really lifelike looking images that just were made up out of thin air, just using technology that didn't exist previously and weren't made by an artist. So um, this set off this huge um, competition with all the tech companies where all of a sudden AI was the thing everyone was talking about and all the companies started racing to compete with each other in between like OpenAI and Microsoft and Google and other companies like that. And then um, like you were saying, by March, we had this shift where um, eventually Pluto went into Aquarius and Saturn departed from Aquarius and went into Pisces, um, which is another major shift. And it seemed like 
um, on the one hand, Pluto going to Aquarius was the acceleration of a lot of these technologies, um, but also a lot of real discussions about where this was headed and that there were some concerns about, like legitimate concerns about um, if there would be some problems associated with these technologies in the future that could actually be problematic for humanity in an existential sense. Um, then at the same time with Saturn going into Pisces, it seemed like some of the image generating technologies really matured and suddenly were making really lifelike images like really easily. And so then all of a sudden there was some discussions about this blurring the, the line between what's real and what's not real and um, the implications of where some of that's headed in the pretty near future. Yeah, I mean, it's gotten pretty crazy. Now it's it it would be easy enough for me to um, record a, an an episode of the astrology podcast, looking like Chris Brennan, sounding like Chris Brennan. You're kind um, of getting there. I mean, the hair, <laughs> yeah, yeah, hair, no, hairstyle. A, I have to say, <laughs> right, right. Um, I'm 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 halfway there as it is, um, but no, I mean, really, sort of quite convincingly at this point, um, this this is what's possible. So. Um, yeah, um, I, th there seems to be a real scramble now uh, in reaction to just how well this technology is doing in terms of, um, it, yeah, people trying to think ahead and think about what could possibly go wrong. Um, yeah, well, well, one of the things in terms of the scramble, just the competition between the companies is, you know, Microsoft moved pretty fast to strike a deal with OpenAI to integrate ChatGPT into their search engine, Bing. And, you know, for the past two decades now, Google has been like the undisputed sort of king of search engines and things like that. But all of a sudden, um, you know, I was I was using it and testing out ChatGPT to research different things. Mm. And it sometimes does just a really good job. Um, it still has major problems. And sometimes it like looks or fakes being more sentient than it actually is. Yeah. Which is something even the founder of OpenAI said that it's really good at giving that appearance, even though underneath it's not actually fully sentient. Um, but I also was using it to tr like translate some stuff because I used to use like Google Translate to translate different things from you know German or, or even from Latin. But I've been using ChatGPT recently, and just it seems to do a much better job of actually understanding language and and translating things. And it suddenly gave me a real understanding of why Google is suddenly like panicking and is suddenly rushing to start getting some things out more. It's because their core business model could be challenged by this if they're no longer the like undisputed king of search engines that people go to. If they start going elsewhere, that creates a whole issue for their entire like ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they've been the big fish in the pond, in the big pond for a long, long time. And this really does shake that all up. Uh, I mean, yeah, speaking of Google Translate, I just saw a video demonstration of, a, of an AI app um, yesterday or the day before that would basically like, you know, you, you could read some text in your own voice and it'll play back your voice um, translating that text into French or Spanish or German or what have you. And really making it sound like you know how to speak those languages, right? Yeah. So it's uh, yeah, like it's already gotten to that point. Not only is the translation better, uh, but but they could you know part of what the deep fake can achieve is to um, yeah to to make it sound like like you speak all these languages. Yeah. Um, so there's that, and then it's like I've documented some of those turning points over the past several months on the forecast episodes. And I talked about this on the year ahead forecast that we recorded in December, and it's been interesting seeing it all play out. Also, the the technology with like the image generating is getting really cr crazy. This is an image that I developed, I created using mid-journey AI of a cat um, who's dressed up as a gentleman who's sitting in an office uh, acting as a detective and researching <laughs> things. And, what a handsome fellow. Right. He's a really handsome cat. But this, like, if if I showed this to you, you know, three or four years ago, you'd have been like, this is a picture that somebody took of a cat yeah. that's that's dressed up. And you wouldn't have any like idea that this is a computer generated image that it that it generated in a matter of like 15 seconds just based on me writing a text prompt and telling it what to generate. 
That's absolutely true. I mean, it's it's astounding what it can do now. Yeah. Well, and it's like, and you, then you can like change it. And then I was like, you know, I took the same prompt and I was like, um, instead of a cat, make it an otter who's dressed up as gentleman is in an office. And this is what it came up with. And it was really, really good and really lifelike. I could do this all day, Chris. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look at cute little critters and in, in, uh, had some little outfits. But yeah, it's yeah, well, well, and in terms of the astrology, it's like what I think is happening here is like the the technology, some of this technology was developed and came out in with Saturn and Aquarius over the past few years. And that's like representing the technological push and the and the development of the technology technology in and of itself. But then what I've noticed is ever since Saturn went into Pisces over the past few months, there's just been this explosion of like creativity suddenly where different people are testing it and pushing the limits and seeing what it can do and doing all sorts of, of weird and really interesting and crazy things. And I think that's part of Saturn and Pisces and also part of the buildup now to the Saturn-Neptune conjunction that's going to go exact yeah. in about three years. And then Saturn and Neptune will continue to be co-present for three years after that. So it's really this six-year period of Saturn uh, conjunct Neptune and the blurring between what's real and what's not real um, being the, the primary keyword for that. And I think that's going to be relevant for things like this in terms of, you know, images, but also like you were talking about, um, like deep fakes and things like that. We saw our first example of like a political image um, that was faked, I think, about a month ago when, you know, Trump announced that he was about to be arrested, but then nothing happened that day, the day that he said it would happen on like a Tuesday or something. But then that day, somebody released an image like this that was like a fake computer generated image of him being tackled by some cops. And some people thought right. that was like was like a real image. And I, and I feel like that was probably really notable historically is probably one of the first images or, or times when an AI generated deep fake like that really had wide circulation all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the, there's also been a, an ad made with, uh, with AI, a political ad already uh, mm -hmm. as well as some commercial ones. So yeah, they're, they're, they're using them to make commercials, but yeah, that, that thing uh, um, with Trump may very well be uh, um, the, the first of its kind. And uh, you know, how fitting is that? <laughs> right. So, yeah, so that's, you know, a big part of this now, because one of the things you brought up that I mentioned, I think, on the year ahead forecast that I thought was cool was, you know, um, Saturn and Pisces back in the 1960s was the time when a bunch of the television networks in the U.S. switched to color. That's and, right. Yeah. And started doing like all by the by the. Um, end of the transit, at least one of the major networks was doing like all color programming, um, which was a huge shift away from the just black and white television shows up to that point. That's right. In 1966, like, uh, you know, if, if you remember the original Star Trek and you, you know that, you know, some guys wear red shirts and they're usually the ones who die in the middle of the episode. And then Spock and McCoy wear blue shirts and Kirk wears, wears a yellow shirt. And that whole idea that the reason their outfits are like that um, is is because uh, NBC was was going to be the all color network, and uh, this was a new NBC show, so they made sure to dress the actors in these very colorful outfits to to promote the fact that they were broadcasting in color. So, um, yeah, you can you can see any of those shows uh, when you got into the nineteen sixty six season. It was the big thing, you know. Color TV was was a thing. Yeah. So it's like we're seeing something similar here with the technology being developed in Aquarius, but then something about the, the creativity of it being fully explored or realized more now with Saturn and Pisces over the next three years. Um, and like we said, all the companies are, are now competing. But so let's talk a little bit about um, at this point about AI and chat GPT and some of the uses of AI for astrology. So right away in December, as soon as this came out and I started playing with it, I immediately um, noticed and saw, I recognized some of the implications for astrology. Because one of the first things that I tried doing was just um, getting it to delineate birth chart placements or other types of astrological placements to do delineations like astrologers do. And one of the things I was really surprised at was that it was actually surprisingly good at doing that. 
Um, and part of the reason for that is one that it was trained on the internet and books and all the things on the internet. And there's like a lot of astrology on the internet over the past 30 years. So it had a lot to draw on. But the other thing is that um, I think one of the reasons why, why it's so good at doing astrology is because astrology is fundamentally a language. And to the extent that ChatGPT is based on a language learning model, um, I think it was able to actually learn astrology as a language and therefore understand how to construct the sentences that astrologers construct when they were making an interpretation of a birth chart, essentially. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's that's exactly the thing that it's been known to excel at uh, so far is, is to, you know, take a big base of knowledge like that and summarize it in this really uh, uh, seemingly knowing sounding fashion. As if right. it really knows what it what it's talking about, which is part of the whole controversy as to just how smart it is or isn't. Right. So let me give you an example. Um, I was just gonna. I I wanted to say that just um it, it occurred to me the other example I'd say about Saturn going into Pisces. You know, we were talking about the color TV example in 1966. The other thing would be in 1993 when Saturn went into Pisces. That's right when Jurassic Park came out and suddenly that that sort of the whole cgi uh you know no one had ever when they were starting to make that movie it was still going to be stop motion you know photography like they did in the 50s so it's another one of these sort of optical advancements if you will right with you know that are super creative uh using yeah. technology that just you know seems um really out of its time when it comes out yeah that makes sense and some of the first uses of like really impressive uses of like computer generated images yeah. um yeah. that looked looked real because that was one of the things it was still a mixture of you know practical effects and and cgi but the cgi in jurassic park still holds up like actually really well to to this day yeah and um, it was it was virtually sort of not invented but really sort of perfected in the making of that movie or perfected to the degree that it was at that time right yeah all right, so here's a delineation. I asked today for a GPT. I said, give a delineation of Jupiter in the seventh house in a birth chart, and it spit this out in about five or 10 seconds. And it said, Jupiter in the seventh house in a birth chart is generally considered to be a positive placement as it indicates that a person will likely have a harmonious and fulfilling marriage or partnership. Jupiter is the planet of expansion, abundance, and good fortune, and its placement in the seventh house suggests that the person may attract a partner who is generous, optimistic, and spiritually inclined. The individual may also value fairness, justice, and equality in their relationships and may seek to establish partnerships based on a mutual respect and cooperation. In the seventh house, the seventh house represents one's one on one relationships including marriage, business partnerships, and close friendships. With Jupiter in this house, the person may have a natural talent for diplomacy, negotiation, and compromise, making them a desirable partner in both personal and professional settings. They may also be attracted to partners who have a strong sense of ethics and a desire to make the world a better place. Overall, Jupiter in the seventh house can indicate a positive and expansive approach to relationships with a desire to create partnerships that benefit both parties involved. However, it's important to note that the full interpretation of this placement depends on the individual's birth chart and should be considered in conjunction with other planetary placements and aspects. So, wow. Couldn't have said it better myself, I gotta say. It's pretty good. Like, I yeah. have to say, like, I mean, I know there's some people that are like skeptical or, or, or might be like, oh, you know, whatever, that's not that great. But like, one of the things you have to keep in mind is this is just the beginning. Like, this is really early stages of this technology. And if this is where it's at now, which is already really good, you know, imagine where this is going to be in like five years or in 10 years or in 20 years or or what have you. And then you start to get a real sense of like what we're on the precipice of basically that we're on the precipice of a really important turning point, not just in like world history, but also potentially for astrology and some of the, some of the implications of that. So yeah, yeah, big time. Yeah, Sorry. <laughs> I was just going to do a little variation and then we can um, we can keep riffing on that. We're actually, yeah, let me give it because this is, a, you know, then once I realized I could do stuff like that, I started doing like fun, funny stuff where I was like, OK, give me the same delineation, but give it in the form of a poem. 
Um, so then it, it returned this in about five seconds, where it says, Jupiter in the seventh, oh, what a sight, a blessing of harmony and delight. In partnerships, you seek to find a soulmate, a love of, a love of a kind. You value fairness and justice so, and partnerships that help you grow. With Jupiter's grace, you're blessed. In love and business, you're truly best. Marriage is important to you indeed, and you want a partner with whom you can lead. You're charming and kind, a joy to be around, and you love, and your love knows no bounds. With Jupiter in the seventh, you have a gift, a natural ease in connection, in connecting and uplift. May your partnerships bring you much joy and Jupiter's blessings, your love never destroy. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Move up move over percy shelley i guess i don't know um or manilius i mean because that's what's funny is that one of the things that all oh, right yeah yeah ask about that is that this is what astrological some astrological textbooks in the ancient world um while some of them were written in prose some of them were written as instructional poems so one of the earliest like complete books on astrology that survives in the Western tradition is from Manilius from like around the year 14 CE or so. And he wrote his text in the form of a poem so that sounded like this because it's actually easier to remember something and commit it to memory if it's in verse like that, if it's in the form of a poem or a song, than it is to just like remember delineations and, and the basic principles if they're just written out more dryly like the first version was. Right. So, um, that's pretty that's pretty cool i mean that starts getting into cool stuff you know i also did other fun stuff that i've talked about in some of the forecast episodes i think in you know december and january where i said okay now do it in the style of the rapper eminem and then it did a really funny mm -hmm. delineation of it in the style of eminem that mimic, mimicked him pretty well um but yeah like this is interesting it can do not just natal chart placements you can also ask it about transits like what does Ju a jupiter transit through the seventh house mean um it even does okay it's not quite as good but it does okay with synastry and you can ask it about like synastry placements between two charts so um yeah so that's pretty interesting and pretty striking and, and that already was just the starting point in december just using chat gpt and using GP, which was based on GPT 3.5. And then already, as you said, in, in March with like Pluto ingressing into Aquarius, they released GPT 4. And all of a sudden it was able to do even more stuff and do even better. Yeah. Yeah. So that, I mean, it's all happened very, very quickly. Right. Yeah. So, um, so this is one area where you know, it's basing this, apparently, you know, a lot of this is it does these different periods will the, they'll train it based on feeding it just tons and tons of data from like the internet. But now they're trying, they're starting to expand to other forms of media, including books and like audio podcasts, or even like YouTube videos and other things like that. So that more and more and more, it, you know, this AI, which has been emerging over the past few years it's training it's being trained on the sort of like totality of human information that's been accumulated over the past 30 years since the internet and the world wide web was really started in the early 1990s especially when saturn was in aquarius back then the first time so on the one mm. hand this has been an interesting kind of like saturn return of the internet and things coming full circle, but also setting a foundation for the next 30 years is now the internet has become the sort of training box or the material needed that's being used to like tr train and create, you know, some sort of artificial intelligence. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, it's a perfect completion of, of where things were at all that time ago with like, you know, user net groups and that kind of thing right uh to now the 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 emergence of the hive mind into something more cohesive and independent right and, and just some of those like aquarian principles um so so that's one thing it's starting to do is be able to generate delineations and that's obviously striking for astrologers um another area which 
it's not as good at now, but I think it will be in the not too distant future is being able to use this technology to enhance our current research capabilities. And that's one of the yeah. things I'm the most excited about and have been thinking about a lot over the past several months um, is that you can use it eventually. You can to some extent now, but especially in the future, use it as an AI assistant in order to do things like, for example, do research and search for correlations or um, do research of people's biographies or to research like world events or different things that have happened in the past and different things like that. So basically to speed up astrological research and some of the things that we already do uh, have done as astrologers and have done for, for many years in the past. Yeah, all that and translate texts. I mean, think about that. Think about that potential. You know? I've actually been, I've been doing that because it knows Latin. And so I've been doing that over the past um, while now, basically, um, because like one of the texts that we have, you know, I mentioned Manilius from the um, first century and I actually gave it um, a test today and I said, you know, just translate this famous passage of Manilius from Latin. And um, I inputted the Latin and then it like pretty quickly like spit out like a really good translation of... Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> and so it says, well, so I, I actually did two things. All right, I'll, I'll read this one first. So this is just like, it was just like translate into English. So it translates and it says, this is Manila. It's a really famous passage of Manilius where he's really doing some very over the top, like stoicism. So he says, why do we spend our lives in such anxious years, tormented by fear and blind desire for things and weighed down by eternal worries while we search for eternity and lose our time without end. And we always act as if we live, but we never really live. Each of us is poor in good things because he seeks more and more and only desires what he does not have. And when nature demands only small necessities, we build with great ambitions and ruin ourselves with extravagance and greed, and we spend all of our wealth on luxury and theft. And the greatest value of our wealth is to waste it all. Mortals, release your minds, enlighten your worries, and waste no more of your life on useless complaints. Fate rules the world. Everything is determined by a certain law, and long periods of time are marked by inevitable events. We are born to die, and our end depends on our beginning. From this come wealth and kingdoms. Often poverty arises, and customs and morals are given to us, as well as vices and praises, losses and gains. No one can avoid what has been given to him or deny what has been taken away from him, and he cannot take fortune against his wishes or avoid it when it is pressed upon him. Everyone must bear, bear his own fate, which is a pretty good translation of that famous passage of Manilius, where he's, you know, it's the first century, Stoicism is very popular, and Manilius is writing as a Stoic, um, a Stoic astrologer. So you know, what's funny is I going along with like the previous one, um, you know, that's not exactly the format that Manilius wrote his poem in because he wrote it in the form of a poem. So I was like, um, okay, so translate it, but put it actually in verse. And then um, it did. So I won't read the entire, I'll read part of it. Um, why do we waste our our anxious years tormented by fear and blind desire and eternal cares as we seek to live a life without end. Um, and it goes on and on and on. Let go, mortal beings, ease your mind and heart. Let go of your empty complaints and fill your life with purpose. Fate governs the world. All things stand fixed, stand by a fixed law. Time marks the events that shape our destiny. We are born to die our fate sealed from the start. From this flows wealth, power, poverty, skills, customs, virtues, vices, praise, loss, and gain. No one can do without what fate has given or gain that which has been denied, nor can anyone escape fate's will. Each of us must bear our own destiny. So, yeah. Yeah. Not too shabby. 
it's not, not bad. Not yeah. bad. I mean, it's still not you know up there as like a human translator and somebody actually trying to render that both as a translation and as a poem, but it's pretty good. And um, yeah, there's all sorts of different ways like that that this technology can be used to again, you know, accentuate or accelerate or expand our capabilities as astrologers in different ways. So I think that's what we should talk about next is pros and cons for astrologers, because there's obviously there's both. Um, yeah. So on the one hand, on the downside and, and the broader discussion that's happening about AI in general, but is also relevant to astrologers is this does have the potential to put some people out of work for some jobs. Um, and there's, there's no way around that because for example, in, in many different sectors, like customer service or other things like that, companies are already scrambling to implement this um, to do certain types of tasks that it excels at or that it can do that otherwise up till now a human would have done, but that companies in using an AI can do that for cheaper. And so therefore they're going to opt to do that. Um, and therefore some people, those jobs just won't exist anymore for humans essentially. Yeah. So that's one of the major like discussions about the emergence of AI over the, the coming decades and the implications that this has for humanity is there's going to be some major social changes that will come with this, yeah. just in the same way that, you know, when the printing press was um, invented in the 15th century, you know, I'm sure that put a lot of scribes out of work because up till that point for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years for many centuries, in order to get a copy of a book, you, you had to have a scribe who could sit down and have one copy of the book and then just write it out by hand into another copy, a copy of another book. And that's how books were made. And that's how information and knowledge in that form was like passed down for many centuries and generations. But then all of a sudden um, you have Gutenberg um, and others come along in the late 15th century and developed a printing press. And then all of a sudden, um, you can make many copies of the book of a book very quickly compared to just a single scribe who can only make one copy of a book at a time very slowly. And that just caused this huge revolution in terms yeah. of printing and, and knowledge. And you have more people reading with more books available. It sort of democratized knowledge to some degree. Uh, they weren't just these rare artifacts that appeared in the hands of a select few. Yeah. Uh, but really went out to the people. And I was looking at that and it seemed like there it was like a Jupiter or uh, sorry, a Uranus Pluto conjunction was happening right around the time of the um, printing of the Gutenberg Bible, mm. which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, that rings a bell, which, uh, yeah, uh, not unlike the 1960s with um, uh, the, the introduction of color TV and all that. Um, yeah, well, 1968, you know, the Uranus Pluto conjunction, the last one was around then and it was around that time, but then also, obviously, there's also an orb on that, which extends the range yeah. of that conjunction about a, you know, a decade yeah. almost on e either side. And when you think of that in that context, the amount of different technologies, sometimes even in very like nascent forms of technologies that were introduced around that time, like in the other episode, in the virtual reality episode, Kent Bai and I talked about how some of the different technologies that now are you know, becoming virtual reality and with the headsets were first mentioned or introduced or demoed way back during that time? Sure, sure. The The conjunction in the 60s was 65 to 66, but I agree that there's a sort of uh, a larger sort of effect of the conjunction. And since the first half in the 70s, Uranus and Pluto were co-present in Libra, you can certainly sort of take that into account as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so that's really important. Um, but like we were saying, I guess the point of that was downside has the potential to put a lot of people out of work. And I know some AI companies are talking about, they actually have like people researching things like universal basic income because of that potential and because of the, the impact that that's going to have on society. So many different and many different areas of society being put out of work and the potential for that how to offset that if we are, you know, if companies are still going to continue to develop this technology and, and release it, how to offset that societally, given that that's almost an inevitability. 
Yeah. And, you know, as far as astrology jobs go, I mean, certainly, you know, people who run, who write, you know, sun sign columns and whatnot, and, and you know, astrology cookbooks, uh, we've already seen from that one description you showed us that their jobs are on the line. Uh, but it'll probably go a lot further. I mean, uh, something with this sort of capacity, uh, you know, before long, the AI itself is your, you know, you have your consult, your consultations with it. Uh, it does everything. It plans your meals for the day. It tells you your transits and, you know, whether or not to, to you know, that today is a good electional, uh, you know, selection for making this choice or that choice. I mean, all that stuff, uh, um, you know, in a friendly voice that that uh, you recognize and, and speak to every day. Um, yeah, you know, they, so are, they, are, they already talk about it being used in the context of, you know, therapy and, you know, uh, 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 people with with you know various kinds of uh, mental illnesses it being treated this way like having having this companion who's with you who knows you who you know guides you through things uh, combine that with a knowledge of astrology and and yeah that that really is something that you know your your average consultant can't compete with right yeah I mean so in the short term like with most fields like lower level um jobs or you know or at least things like that like you know some forms of interpretation or or let's say sun sign columns or other things like that um we will probably see this the use of ai and things like chat gpt used more in those contexts which then yeah that may mean you know astrologers themselves like in previous years for many decades for example with like newspapers they would have to hire like an astrologer to write like a forecast column or to write a sun sign column or what have you um but that's you know an area where there might be some issues and then eventually also in terms of astrologers doing consultations for people um i think currently that's not on the line because the ai has an issue with synthesis and i think that's going to be one of the things that'll be a question how much the ai eventually is able to synthesize things you know because if it is then then um that does encroach on what you know astrologers are doing in a consultation versus if it's not fully able to synthesize everything together then that still leaves a lot of room for the astrologers to be useful and helpful in a consulting setting um, yeah, as things stand right now, sure. But if you wind up indeed with the, you know, this this machine that just keeps learning, uh, if it does wind up a like you're, you know, like you're saying, learning how to synthesize information better, um, but you know, but also just really sort of have its, you know, have a level of astro astrological knowledge that really does surpass any individual person's, then then it's, yeah probably curtains yeah. for these jobs yeah yeah so at least in the the traditional form that we're used to them or that we um so it's like I know there's some people that will bring up things like intuition and whether that plays a role in astrology and whether that's something that will always remain the domain of of astrologers to some extent and I don't know mm -hmm. how much I how I feel about that argument because I guess it just depends on how much astrology is a technical language and how much like technical proficiency with astrology an ability to interpret the symbols as something that is like a natural property of the cosmos. Um, yeah, that'll be really interesting to see in the coming it, coming decades. You, you just reminded me of a study I heard quoted last night um, where they, they had um, GPT and doctors give diagnoses to patients and they, they, they tested about equal, but the, the, the AI tested stronger in, in empathy. <laughs> <laughs> the, okay. the doctor. <laughs> so their medical language was on par, their medical knowledge rather was on par, but the AI did better in terms of expressing empathy and, you know, really being there for the patient. Yeah. Well, that reminds me of, even though it's like fiction, there's still something that might be relevant about it where, you know, like the, in the matrix, there was like the architect who designed the matrix, but it was meant to be this simulation to keep humans um, docile uh, but they kept rejecting it and they kept rejecting different forms of it. And then part of the story was that there was a like an oracular or there was a, a feeling um, a artificial intelligence, which was named the Oracle that ended up developing the matrix that took because it gave humans like the choice of whether to accept it or not. 
And as long as they were given that choice, even on the subconscious level, they would accept it. Um, but just the idea of, you know, can you, could you develop like an intuitive or uh, an emotional or like that level of intelligence and not just the other version of intelligence that we're used to, which is just like data and facts and things like that. Um, because we're not used to thinking that that's possible, but it's like, we don't, we don't know if that's possible or not. And yeah, it could, it could be. Yeah. I mean, if it really could learn the language of astrology at a level that we're not yet aware of, we only can sort of suspect or imagine or believe in, um, then, then, you know, theoretically you would have an intelligence that just reads the chart literally and is accurate for doing so because it understands the system so well you know in other words it doesn't it doesn't have to uh, intuit anything um although it's already showing a capacity to express empathy but just uh you know if it's if it's that good at, at just laying out the astrology then then you know um uh, just on points of accuracy it'll it'll be a really tough show to beat yeah well and you know, one of the things I mentioned on the last AI episode with Ken a year ago was to invert this a little bit is astrology itself actually, I think, presents a model for consciousness. So that could actually be a really interesting avenue for AI researchers to pursue is just that astrology is already a system that's des that's designed in order to describe consciousness and to describe people's lives. And I bet if you attempted to map that and sort of recreate that potentially as a model for AI, if you're trying to create what we'll start talking about here in a little bit, which is artificial general intelligence or like sentience or human level intelligence and in AI, that would be a really good route to go of the giving you already like a, a blueprint for the types of things that it would need to be able to do and, and sort of like cover and think about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, okay, so there could be some problems for astrologers in terms of jobs and things like that. However, on the other hand, um, I do think in other areas, it may just enhance our capabilities um, and that there may be things that, uh, that human astrologers can do with this technology and they can leverage it in order to do other things that either weren't possible or that would have taken much longer previously. And in that way, I think we may be able to harness it in ways that are constructive and useful in terms of the astrological community and in terms of the continued sort of like preservation of the astrological tradition. Um, and one of my points about this, because a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of tensions because AI, artificial intelligence, and some of the things associated with it make a number of people like uncomfortable. And there's sometimes a desire to like reject it sort of out of hand. But one of my things over the past several months as I've been thinking about that and seeing some of the different reactions is just this technology is not going away. Like it's not going anywhere. This is only going to get, things are only going to head more and more in this direction and it's not going to stop anytime soon because of the inertia behind it. And because um, so many companies, both private companies, as well as governments and other things are working on this at this point um we've sort of passed i think the point of no return so i think instead of just like you know putting our head in the sand and, and pre pretending that it doesn't exist um i think it's best to learn how to work with it um and how to learn how to harness this and use it to expand our capabilities just because this is like the new world that we're moving into in the same way that you know, when the internet was developed in the 1990s, you know, there were some people that learned how to use it or like learned how to use personal computers and used how, learned how to use them to um, enhance things that they already did. Like, you know, no longer having to write on a piece of paper, like a letter to somebody and then like mail it, send it in the mail, but instead learning how to write an email and learning that you could send like, you know, 10 emails a day or 20 emails a day or something like that which just enhanced your capability to do something that you already did. But there was definitely like a learning curve of like, you know, learning how to use a keyboard or learning how to use the internet or email or something like that. I think we're in a similar time period right now where learning how to work with AI 
<clears throat> there's a bit of like a learning curve of learning like what its capabilities are and how to get it to do what you want it to do through different prompts and different things like that. Um, you know, it takes some learning, but if you put the effort into learning how to use it, then you can do some things that are kind of kind of cool. And that's going to be one of the things that might be partially like a generational divide here coming up is people that have either put in the work to learn how to do that um, in order to understand how to use the technology, or even people that have grown up, you know, with AI being around or some of these tools being available to them from very early on, and therefore it becomes like secondhand to them versus people that that don't or didn't grow up in that context or didn't put in the time learning how to use it, there may be like a disadvantage or at least some sort of distinction there um, that starts to grow between those those groups of people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, 10 years time, some of us will be, you know, whatever designing designing our own houses using uh, AI and then other people still trying to be figure out you know, trying to figure out how to use the mouse. If you remember when the internet came along, there was, there were always those who were challenged learning how to use the mouse. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, and it's like astrologers are generally early adopters of new technologies, though they always have been historically, yeah. like for example, um, personal computers and and some early, some of the early earliest like software programs were for astrology and astrology astrologers moved into um creating programs for astrology in order to speed up the process of chart calculation pretty early on yeah. in the 1960s and 70s and 80s um and then even with the internet for example you had some companies like astrodeanst or astro.com that were very early adopters of putting chart calculation services as well as um you know horoscopes and other things like that predictions or forecasts online um, and there's been other historical instances of that as well in the past, where sometimes it's the astrology itself with, which motivates the technological innovations, like for example, in astronomy, where it was like the need to, to calculate charts sometimes was the reason or the motivation for developing new astronomical models and techniques or, or doing different empirical observations and things like that. Sure. Tycho Brahe, um, you know, Kepler, Galileo, these were all uh astrologers building on existing technology, improving it and and uh and yeah, certainly the need to to be, you know, better to better serve their astrological clients was was as much of a motivation as anything else. Yeah, and and being and you know, Claudius Ptolemy as well in the second century. But um, yeah, so I think that's important for us to keep in mind because I know there's going to be dialogues about this. I know there's going to be sometimes tensions surrounding it. For example, with artificial intelligence and some of the image generators, there's definite like issues there in terms of um, some of the image generators are taking the styles of different artists and then yeah. recreating them. And that's creating serious ethical issues in terms of things like styles kind of being ripped off and being used and, and issues of like of ownership and of different things like that that are genuine um issues and i'm sure there's a number of other related things there's, like that there's a song by the weekend that wasn't really by the weekend you know um like like being able to recreate the not just the songwriting style but the the whole musical style and recreate the vocal style of a of a given artist you know so right um yeah we could try and get more Beatles songs more Billie Holiday recordings more you know anything um yeah I mean that's gonna be god that's gonna that's and this is just the start like just think of where you know I'm just thinking of the Saturn Neptune conjunction you know yeah. that doesn't doesn't peak for like three more years and this is still the early version of that and I just remember you know the last hard aspect between Saturn and Neptune about seven years ago in in 2016 time frame was entirely about um fake news was like the keyword that really came up that year especially during that u.s presidential election and right. that was when saturn was squaring neptune um mm -hmm. and we can already kind of see as we head into this saturn neptune conjunction um just the potential for some of some of that yeah for sure for sure i mean um you know the the last time we had Saturn Uranus uh, conjunct was in the you know the late 1980s in 1989, 
Saturn Uranus or Saturn Neptune? Saturn Neptune, I mean. Uh, did I say okay. Saturn Uranus? I'm sorry. That was that's um, right. it was all happening around the same time. Um, but yeah, that was the last time we had that conjunction. Um, there was a lot of stuff going on, but it certainly it it involved a huge sort of opening up. I mean, literally the Berlin fall, wall uh, came down, you know, when Saturn and Neptune were conjunct. Um, the the idea of like dissolving some seemingly uh, insurmountable boundary, you know, uh, it tends to come along with that. So it's not just the sort of the technical uh, innovation, but it's it's really something that seems to 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 achieve the the unimaginable. Um, and you know, on on those lines, that's that's you know, that's where I think uh, um, that's going to be part of the experience when we get there next time. Um, the, the other thing that Saturn Neptune reminds me of is the conjunction in Libra in the early 1950s, back around 1953. Um, this coincided with uh, a, a CIA program called MK Ultra, which was about sort of like, it was a covert pro, uh, program using LSD to try and, and control people's minds. But the idea being uh, uh, Saturn Neptune being sort of like these really hardcore scientific uh, types of uh, uh, investigations and and you know reaping sort of results and consequences that that um, just people are never prepared to 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 handle when they come. Right. Um, here, this is good. This is relevant. I just asked ChatGPT GPT to give a delineation <laughs> of Saturn conjunct Neptune in astrology, and it says. Saturn conjunct Neptune in astrology is an interesting combination of energies. Saturn is the planet of structure, responsibility, and discipline, while Neptune is associated with dreams, illusions, and the subconscious mind. When these two planets come together, there's a potential for deep internal conflict between these energies. On the positive side, this aspect can bring about a desire to create something meaningful and long-lasting. There may be a strong drive to pursue a creative or spiritual path, but with the practical discipline to make it happen. There's a desire to connect with the divine, but with a grounded, realistic approach. So that's the positive delineation. On the negative side, there may be a tendency towards confusion and self-deception, as well as a difficulty with boundaries and limitations. There can be a feeling of being lost or disconnected and a struggle to find a sense of purpose or direction. It's important to maintain a clear sense of reality and not get lost in escapist tendencies. Um, Overall, this aspect can bring about a powerful opportunity for growth and self-discovery, but it requires a strong commitment to both the spiritual and practical sides of life. There may be challenges and obstacles along the way, but with hard work and dedication, the potential for personal transformation is great. So, you know, it's really funny because it's it's obviously the majority of what what GPT found on the internet is like modern psychological astrology, yeah, and that's it, so what it, I'm it, thinking. It has that like very specific bent and as well it uses, as a, it uses the word energies, a combination of those energies. That's a an immediate sort of yeah, modernist energy. Right. Um, as well as a more like optimistic bent. Um, but you know, that's how it is now. And I'm sure, you know, that will change or can be modified as as astrology changes as and as it continues to be trained. But um that does give us some kind of keywords here. Um, here is actually, no, I was going to show the transits, but maybe not right now. So let me go back to the outline. Um, I think we're ready to translation transfer into philosophical topics, but was there anything we need to say in order to wrap up that section we were just talking about? We were talking about Saturn, Neptune, we were talking about possible upsides and downsides for astrologers. Um, was there anything else on that point? Uh, not on that point specifically. No, no. Let's move on to the philosophy. All right. So there's just a bunch of different philosophical topics that people are talking about when it comes to um, AI at this point that I wanted to talk about a little bit because it helps to set the context for some of the things that may be coming up in the future and then can help us contextualize after that. We'll talk about some of the transits that are coming up in the next couple of decades. So right now, um, a lot of AI researchers and companies are working on or kind of working towards creating what they call artificial general intelligence or AGI, um, which is defined in different ways, but broadly speaking, 
Um, it often refers to creating human level intelligence in computers or creating an artificial intelligence that has the, the same level of reasoning and ability to do things in a number of different areas that humans do. Because up to this point, most of the AIs are just very narrow in that they're very good at doing very specific things. Like you have one that can generate images or you have chat GPT that can generate text or what have you. But at some point, um, and this is the question is whether we'll get to that point and whether it's possible to create um, an artificial intelligence that is this, the same or similar to humans in terms of human capabilities and human thought and the ability to reason and think and even make choices. Um, so that's one of the questions. That's one of the things all AI is sort of like heading towards. And one of the big questions of this century is one, is that possible? And then two, um, when will that happen? And then three is going to be like, what are the implications or what happens at that point if humans are successful in creating artificial general intelligence? Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's that's uh, well put. I mean, that's the, the, you know, right now it can just sort of mimic intelligence. So the idea that it can uh, reach the level of, of like actual sort of human style into intelligence is the next step. Yeah, there. I do remember there was a. It was literally within days of the, um, the Pluto ingress towards the end of March. There was this paper that was published, um, in like a journal under Cornell University, I think, but the title was "Sparks of Artificial General Intelligence: Early Experiments with ChatGPT," where they were saying this group of researchers was saying that um, it wasn't artificial general intelligence yet, but that it was showing sparks of it and that they felt like it was headed in that direction. And the fact that that occurred so close, literally within days of, or within like 24 hours of the Pluto ingress of Pluto into Aquarius, I think is very important because I think that sets a time frame for us of what this transit of Pluto through Aquarius is going to be about. And um, it also gives us an end point when we start looking at the astrology of what sort of time frame we're talking about. And since that Pluto transit just started in 20, early 2023 and it lasts until, what is it, 2044? 2043-44, yeah. 43-44, so 20 years, that gives us a, a time frame of what we're going to be looking at here potentially if the start of that transit, which is, is I think, one of the principles in astrology that sometimes yeah. you'll see the when a planet first moves into a new sign, you'll see an early preview of what that entire transit is going to be about by the time it finishes and by the time you look back at it retrospectively when the planet leaves that sign, sometimes you can see that the early origins of what would happen or the most yeah. important things that would take place start to develop as soon as the planet goes into that sign. So for example, with that, remember um, very early when Pluto first ingressed into Capricorn in the late 2000s, um, 2008, that, yeah. 2008, like we had the financial crisis hit, the worldwide financial crisis, but then also as a result of that or in connection with that, the the anonymous person who invented Bitcoin developed a Bitcoin like very early after Pluto ingressed into Capricorn. And then um, that has just like grown and developed over the course of that transit until it eventually became something that's made making a major difference in the world and seems to be here to stay. Or even if that specific thing isn't like the idea of like digital currencies, that was the first one. And that was the one really that has, has um, changed the world in some notable ways in terms of setting the the stage for that and making that a common thing. Yeah, especially because if you go back to the year 12, 26, 27, uh, when Pluto uh, was making an ingress into uh, an air sign like it is now, uh, that was when uh, Chinggis Khan uh, first uh, introduced the first international paper money currency. Uh, so that also, you know, if you if you think about how that connects with uh, with Bitcoin, 
um yeah paper money it had, it had always been coins until the mongols came west mm -hmm. okay yeah and then it's just like if you just look at um like a timeline for example of like the value of bitcoin um while that's fluctuated obviously a lot over the past few years you can kind of see you know it wasn't worth anything early on and people were you know some of the early adopters spent just like thousands of bitcoin or whatever it was just to buy a pizza or something like that and those are some of the first you know major milestones but then eventually the price you know started going up in the mid 2010s until it was eventually worth just tons and tons of money by the late 2010s and early 2020s and still is what it's worth like $28,000 for one bitcoin today yeah Yep. versus you know the, the the small sort of humble origins of where it started in the 2008 2009 2010 time frame just after pluto went into capricorn so as astrologers it's like we have to think about that we have to pay very close attention to and that's why i'm doing this episode some of the things that are happening now at the beginning of this transit of pluto into aquarius and document them because they are sort of like intimations or yeah. pre previews of things to come that's absolutely right um I'm reminded uh when when Pluto went into Aquarius in 1778 this is right at the point I think we might have discussed this in a previous uh, episode but it bears mentioning again um in early 1778 Pluto made its ingress into Aquarius the last time since before, you know until now and uh, that was right when the King of France agreed to support the American rebels in their war against uh, the British Empire. Mm. And so the French spent, you know, a lot of money and, uh, you know, it, it worked. It helped the Americans win that revolutionary war. Uh, but it was something that came back to bite them. And by the time Pluto left Aquarius in the mid late 1790s, uh, the revolution did happen. The king had been beheaded, uh, all all largely sparked by the fact that the treasury had, you know, was was so low and people were going hungry. Uh, and arguably, if that money hadn't been spent on the American Revolutionary War, the French Revolution might not have happened. Very likely, wouldn't have. So there's there's that sort of long term consequence. Um, but yeah, you always see. Pluto in particular, when it makes an ingress into a new sign, often heralds this this just this new age that that puts the old one sort of out to pasture very quickly. Um, and you mentioned the Pluto ingress coinciding with that that uh, article that you, that you uh, showed us. Can uh, I mention the with the Sibley chart really quickly because that's a really good point. So it's like yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. When the U.S. was founded, like you were saying, like Pluto was in late Capricorn. And during the course of the during the Declaration of Independence, but it was like during the course of the American Revolutionary War that Pluto went into Aquarius. Yeah, basically, so, when when they went from being you know uh, a group of upstart colonists, uh, you know, feuding with their king, uh, and sort of were transformed into you know the war becoming this international affair, you know, uh, having having a, a very powerful ally that can actually. Uh, pay for the war to be fought so yeah um it's it's a pretty big deal yeah well that by the end of that by the end of the war basically which ended in the what 20 early 20 or early 1780s 17, yeah yeah um, um but the battle of yorktown was was uh 1781 and and the the treaty that ended the war was signed in 1783 so depending on what you want to choose as the ending of the war yeah uh, so by totally by the cool. end of that time like pluto is like firmly in aquarius and it's like it's yeah. a done it's a done deal like the united states is a is yeah. now a country and that's not going back so i didn't fully notice or recognize this but didn't think about the fact that um uranus was also in gemini at that time yeah. which just is one like of the will be. yeah just like just it, like, just like, like it happen. will be which is one of the transits that we're about to, we're going to talk about that's coming up in the future is yeah Uranus going into Gemini and and trining Pluto and Aquarius and really accelerating a lot of this technological and, and communication stuff. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, uh, uh, and the other thing, just just to uh, go back to that um, the the Pluto ingress that we had uh, in March, because you were talking about that paper that you showed us. Mm -hmm. uh, what it was right when Pluto stationed retrograde. Its first station was May first, which is right when uh, Jeffrey Hinton, called the who's the godfather of AI, announced that he was leaving Google so that he could speak freely to. Uh, um, you know, critique the way AI is, uh, the AI sort of movement is growing. And he was someone who'd been a very firm advocate for it right up until now. And suddenly he's done this big uh, about face and he's uh, yeah. playing Cassandra. Right. Well, he's talking about some of the, the dangers and some of the issues that are coming up um, because he's, he thought uh, in some of the interviews he's done over the past week or two since that Pluto station happened, he's said he thought artificial general intelligence was further off in the future and now he thinks it's moving it's much closer than he thought and therefore some of the potential issues for humanity that could arise from that are more pressing to start actually talking about and trying to work on and raise the alarm bells about um than than he thought previously yeah yeah exactly so that's um that happened with that first station, which is also, you know, something of a, of an alert, an early, early warning system. Yeah, because a station is always the intensification of a transit of whatever that planet, especially an outer planet. Um, so that was notable that that coincided so closely with the very first station of Pluto in that sign, because yeah. we're going to have a lot more of those stations over the next 20 years. Yeah. What what's the like what would the estimate be i know we don't have that tabulated but like how many stations are we talking about over like a 20 year period with pluto well there'll, there'll be one retrograde and one direct station per year uh um, right between now and 2044 in aquarius so, so like so that's 40. 20 yeah yeah 40 yeah. if you take the retro and and direct stations yeah right all right so that was the very first one so we've got both notable events with ai on the ingress and notable events with it on the station and then i'm sure whoever know, whatever wasn't in the news because that's the other thing is like we're talking about things that were publicly known but sometimes it's not until many years later that you look back and and learn about some important development that took place at a certain time that coincided with an astrological event but it just wasn't public knowledge yet like you know just imagine um the manhattan project and if you were an astrologer living during that time and like you're seeing all these crazy astrological alignments taking place that are indicating major things but you're just not aware of that the atomic bomb has just been developed and and what a major turning point that was for yeah. science and world history because it was like a secret project at that point yeah yeah so okay so going back to artificial general intelligence um you know the the goal and the question is about creating sentience in a machine um and to create machines that can think and reason and solve problems like humans so one of the big things then and one of the big discussions then that's coming up that i think is really interesting especially as pluto's moved into aquarius is the implications of creating a new intelligence here on earth um because one of the ways of thinking about it or looking at it is it's like creating a new alien species that's here on earth living with humans you know that has human level intelligence and that humans just suddenly like created this new species that's here and has its own thought process and thoughts and and reflections and and potentially choices um yeah but may not even though it may not think the same as humans because it's their brains artificial intelligence or general intelligence the brains would work differently one of the things that like um hinton points out that it was one of the reasons that he raises the alarm bells is he gave an example of like you know if a scientist like let's say einstein or somebody made a new discovery about quantum mechanics um and they want to share that with somebody it's like they have to try to teach somebody else another human with their biological brain the principles of that in order to transmit it to them and there's like a process of the other human learning and like taking in that information of that new scientific discovery before it fully like sets in whereas for an artificial intelligence um if it makes a scientific discovery 
uh, or a new principle of the universe or something like that, it's able to instantaneously transmit that to all other artificial intelligences and have them understand it immediately. So that's one of the things that's important is just that um, the way that an artificial intelligence can think and learn and process knowledge is really diff different at the very least than humans, but also potentially there's certain capabilities that it would have that would exceed humans in really notable ways. Yeah, yeah. Well put. Yeah. So um, I think in terms of the astrology, this idea of creating a sort of new species that thinks differently than humans, but possesses intelligence, it really make, makes me think of, of, of Aquarius um, like symbolically as pertaining to that which is alien or that which is foreign or that which is different are sort of like broad themes or symbolic themes that do sometimes come up with Aquarius. And it's interesting thinking about that in this context of, you know, that humanity may be, that the, the turning point that we may be on is humanity creating another sentient species on earth so that we're no longer at the very least like the only sentient species here on earth right and that could that could be part of the mm. broader like symbolic thing that we're talking about here in terms of pluto and aquarius yeah i mean think about it um, going back to the american revolutionary war for a second i mean um uh because after the war was over of course they had the constitutional conference and the united states became a country and elected George Washington president and all that stuff followed while Pluto was in Aquarius. And when you think about it, like if you, if you go to the mindset of an 18th century European, you suddenly with Pluto coming into Aquarius, you had this new kind of creature to contend with, which was a human being who was not beholden to any Royal, um, which, you know, European, Europe, Europeans had not seen the likes of for quite some time. Um, it really was like the creation of some new kind of intelligence. And um, <clears throat> yeah, you know, taking the, the the Pluto ingress into Aquarius to be a sort of spark of independence, if you will, um, you know, just like we expect AI eventually to do, you know, uh, the, the Americans came up with a constitution, decided on on who they were and, and what their mission was. And perhaps over the course of Pluto being in Aquarius this time, that's exactly... Um, how uh, AI, you know, winds up evolving. Um, right. If, if it becomes AGI over the course of this one transit or not, you know, the the, the leaps and bounds it makes to getting there. Yeah, uh, well, because it, it would, if it was sentient or had choices or or different things like that, it would raise a number of like moral and, and ethical issues at some point in terms of the relationship between humans and and whatever that is in, in artificial intelligence. Yeah, exactly. That's a really good point, though, about the the, the governments that the um, the U.S. in creating that at the time around the time of the Pluto ingress would be like this very different and very foreign or sort of like alien entity compared to the way that things were being done, sort of like elsewhere up to that point, or or being done in Europe up to that point, and then even not long after that, you also had the French Re Revolution at the same time. Yeah, which uh, where again you had that same idea of of you know having a republic and no king and people being uh, uh, accountable for their own affairs and all that stuff that sort of po post serfdom uh, worldview that was emerging. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, well, that's important to think about. Um, so okay, so that's artificial general intelligence and the question of like if that's possible and and like when and and what that would look like if you know with AGI that's just achieving human level intelligence but then the question is like what happens after that because there's the potential that once that's achieved if that's achieved that there's the potential for it to go beyond that um because al already we've talked about for example that AI that artificial intelligence is unique and that it doesn't have the same biological limitations that humans do. Um, so both in terms of like transferring or, or distributing knowledge instantaneously to all other AIs where humans cannot necessarily do that, or if they do, it's very slow. But that that's that brings in the other part, which is that AI would move and think 
faster than humans, um, just based on our our you know our biological limitations and the the things that we're able to store in our brain and how quickly we're able to bring them up, versus something like an AI, which as we've seen with ChatGPT, can just like instantaneously pull up. Um, information from like the totality of the internet and the totality of of stored and accumulated knowledge that exists up to that point within a matter of, of seconds so we start getting into this this area where ai could surpass humans if it gets to that level of artificial general intelligence then around that time or not long after that we get into the realm of it actually surpassing humans and what that looks like um, because this is when you get into the the realm of the way that some people talk about it is almost like humans are trying to, or they're on the verge of potentially creating like a god or creating some sort of godlike figure in the sense that it's something that both far surpasses human capabilities, but also in the sense that in not having the same biological limitations, you're also creating something that's functionally immortal, essentially because it's not something that that has the same life cycle that humans have in terms of it having to die um whereas for us you know at this point we we do yeah i mean that this has occurred to me um it it you know it doesn't have a body but it would know how to make a body for itself one that it can sort of discard and detach itself from unlike the rest of us um you know so it it, it but yeah it, it it wouldn't have a body but the more it's integrated into our society, the more it might be like you, you're talking about creating a god. I mean, uh, if you have intelligence that that can be omnipresent uh, and uh, and have a, an ethical code, and conceivably even you know act like you know what you know become a sort of policing force, if you will, uh, prevent violence between human beings and you know any number of things um are possible as it sort of becomes more integrated in our society and yeah you could wind up with like a literal immortal omnipresent being uh that watches over everything we do and and judges us accordingly and uh it'll sure speed the court system up uh because it'll know immediately who's guilty of what sure no, so no need to go to a jury of your peers or any of that stuff because you know everything's recorded it knows but then again, maybe there's no crime because it literally stops everyone from committing a crime before they're able to do it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, um, so, so this gets into the area where we're talking about. I'm getting into like, a little sci-fi here, but these are just things that occurred to me. You know that that it can wind up doing. Right. Yeah. Um, so, but what we're talking about at this point is the idea of like super intelligence that humans yeah. in this, let's say, this century or in the not too distant future may be creating something that's super intelligent. So it's not just a matter of creating something that has human-like intelligence or capabilities, but that something that may surpass us. And this idea of super intelligence is really important and also important as astrologers as we think about, as we look into the future, what we might be looking for, what we might be trying to identify in the timeline um, is both that as well as it, then it gets into some more and this starts getting into more almost like sci-fi concepts, although it's not clear they might be grounded in things that are feasible, which is ideas of like the singularity and the notion that if something like that, like a super intelligence is developed, that on the positive side, um, the speed of scientific discoveries may speed up as well as technological discoveries. If you create something that's smarter than humans, that's able to surpass our capabilities, then it'll be similar to other technological revolutions that we've had in the past where suddenly several different technologies all converge or several different discoveries all converge around the same time and just lead to this explosion of new technology and discoveries and scientific advancements basically in, in the world and in terms of our understanding of the universe. And at that point, so much starts happening that it's hard to predict what will happen after that because um you just reach this 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 turning point in humanity where so much comes out of a number of things that we can't fully anticipate at this point yeah no that's absolutely true um 
you know, if, if you could explain the 20th century to someone who was alive in the year 1900, explain that you're about to have airplanes that, uh, you know, uh, radios, uh, you know, let alone the internet. Um, right. Where like any one of those discoveries could blow somebody's mind, but then when you're talking about really hundreds or thousands. Yeah. Yeah. But they all sort of came about, you know, one after the other and, and changed the world in a really quick way to, to the point where people just didn't recognize the world they'd been born into. And yeah, this would just be, you know, that much more, uh, disorienting and, and disconnected from the reality that certainly you and I have grown up with. Right. Yeah. Or even because, and, and sometimes we see this even in small increments, like I'm always blown away by the amount of technological advancement that happened in World War II over the course of a relatively like short span of time of like a decade yeah. or less. And just like how fast the pace of technology developed at that time. Yeah. 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 And all kinds of amazing and random ways too you know um uh, the atom bomb is the obvious one but other other things like you know hetty lamar the hollywood actress who co-designed uh this spread spectrum technology that that eventually led to the invention of the cell phone uh you know all kinds of things like that that were coming about um yeah code breaking technology computer technology certainly um IBM famously using their punch card system to organize the the concentration camps. I mean, you know, the, just all kinds of stuff that was going on then. Yeah, of like really terrible stuff like that, as well as yeah, other as well more as positive, positive things, things. Or yeah, 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 or or things that were terrible that then later were put to more constructive uses later. Sure. Um, like rocket technology, for example, and, and some of yeah. that. Or or the IBM punch cards. Eventually they were used to a better purpose. But yeah, uh, absolutely. But they came about from some dark corners of, of uh, intellectual life. Right. So that's a good example of World War II, because again, that was a, a good chunk of that. And some of those advancements were a similar time period that were on the cusp of, of like Uranus in Gemini. And that's one that I want to talk about here in, in just a little bit very soon when we get to the the future forecast section here in terms of looking at the astrological transits is that's one that's coming up and yeah. that's a good reference point to think of, um, you know, in terms of the pace of technology sometimes with, with certain transits. Yeah. All right. So um, singularity, pace of technology, um, questions arising at that point about whether this is a good thing for humanity or not. And then this is when the big topic that comes up that a lot of people are talking about is the concept of AI alignment, um, which is the question of, of trying to ensure that the goals and the values um, or the ends, the things that AI is focused on are in alignment with humans because the fear is that there's an issue if like the goals or the values or the focus of AI gets out of alignment with humanity, that it could lead to um, some major potentially like catastrophic issues for humanity if we've created a sentient like alien species, which suddenly if their existence is not in alignment with ours or um, somehow starts running counter to ours, it could lead to, like in the worst case scenario, and some of the greatest fears, like the extinction of humanity. Um, and that's actually like some, uh, like a legitimate concern that it seems like a fair number of, of high profile AI researchers actually think about and spend time thinking about and discussing and reflecting and trying to figure out how to avoid that. Um, and I think that's really interesting because that's also a theme of Pluto transits when Pluto goes into different signs of different fears of, of things surrounding the quality of that sign coming up. And it seems like that's going to be one of the major um, things surrounding this transit is fears of AI and mm -hmm. the extent to which sometimes those are legitimate fears and legitimate things to be careful about and to try to work on to avoid versus um, other areas where sometimes some of those fears may not pan out or may not turn out to be as bad as people fear, um, but that you'll probably have both sides of that that spectrum. It kind of reminds me also how Lisa Scheim pointed this out on the year ahead forecast when we were discussing AI and some of that in the future. And she pointed out that the author 
um, Mary Shelley had Pluto and Aquarius conjunct the midheaven, um, mm -hmm. you know, way back over a century ago, the last time Pluto was in Aquarius, and they were the author of um, Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Yeah. So it's so interesting um, that you have somebody like that from, let me pull up the chart really quickly. <clears> from <throat> She was born August 30th, 1797 at about 11.20 p.m. in London with um, the midheaven around 27 degrees of Aquarius and Pluto around 29 degrees of Aquarius. Yeah. And it's just like, and, and way back then, writing a story about her, becoming partially known for a story about creating, you know, an artificial uh, a, a machine or a monster. Life, yeah. Yeah. yeah, like artificial life, but then also the idea of it getting out of control and, and becoming like a threat or becoming dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the perfect uh, analogy for, for, and it's been used many times, many times uh, as an analogy for, for potentially destructive science. Um, you know, uh, certainly uh, um, when it came to the atom bomb, you know, that, that was a Frankenstein monster of sorts. Um, but yeah, this is, this is even more so. Uh, even more so, uh, because it it is this sort of independent intelligence that can act of its own accord. That you know, I mean, that's what Frankenstein brought up was all these sort of philosophical questions about existing, about what life is, you know, uh, about what being human is, and um, yeah, all that stuff. So, right, uh, it's yeah. pretty remarkable. So, yeah, yeah. So if if AI is sent sentient, basically, and starts making its own choices, what if some of those end up being detrimental to humanity um, in different ways? Um, you know, like, for example, if AI notices that, like, if, because um, the issue is, like, the that humans are going to attempt to give the AI rules and directives, but sometimes it could end up being, like, one of those situations of, like, be careful what you wish for, or those kind of like fables where somebody wishes for something, but then it turns out to be quite different than what they expect because like, you know, the, the genie in the bottle, like interprets the wish literally or something like that. So if it's like the AI is given like a simple directive, like, you know, um, ensure that humanity survives for the next thousand years, but then it, but then it notices that humans are like destroying the planet um, through, let's say, environmental reasons, so that it takes that directive and then decides that we need to like stop using fossil fuels immediately and just like removes somehow our ability to do that. Um, and suddenly humanity is like, ha you know, thrown into like major tumultuous like world event because the AI was given a directive that suddenly con conflicted with what humanity was doing at the time. Um, I guess there could be like, you know, pros and cons or arguments about whether that would be good or bad, but it's just an example of how um, this is a really tricky issue of how to make sure that the AI doesn't end up doing something that ends up either harming or being detrimental or working at cross purposes to humanity for different reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, again, it's hard to not get into a sort of, uh, um, you know, sci-fi mindset uh, when it comes to this. Uh, there's also the question of sort of self-preservation. Like if we, you know, once the once AI is smarter than us and if it starts to do things that, you know, uh, like you're suggesting cut off our oil supply or something like that, um, you know, it would, it would, it, and, and we wanted to shut it down, it would sort of fight and defend itself, not unlike, uh, you know, HAL in 2001, A Space Odyssey, you know, where, where, uh, the computer sort of malfunctions to the degree that the uh, the astronauts that it's in charge of uh, um, try to disable it, and it winds up murdering one of them and almost murdering the other. Uh, you know, th those types of scenarios uh, um, occur to one as well. Uh, but yeah, that could be the thing. And it just like, you know, human beings are, are really irrational. <laughs> and, a, and an intelligence of this kind might, you know, might not be too indulgent of the irrational you know yeah well i i've been thinking about that a lot recently and i was reading this famous book from like the 70s by ernest becker titled the Den denial of death 
Um, and the thesis, just on the Wikipedia page, it says the author argues that most human action is taken to ignore or avoid the inevitability of death. Um, and I kind of wonder, you know, with the, these attempts to create sentience, so much of our human existence is based around some of our biological constraints and things like that, like the knowledge of the inevitability of death, which becomes more, we become more conscious of sometimes the older we get, uh, especially, you know, in like the second half of our lives, for example, and coming to terms with that in different ways, or the different ways that humans themselves attempt to achieve immortality through either their works and like creating something that lasts beyond them through, let's say, their career or their creative output, or in other ways, humans try to achieve a sort of immortality by having like children and like creating copies of themselves in a way that then lives on and carries on a part of them into the future. Um, there's so many different things like in biological things. I wonder if at some point, you know, AI researchers might hit a wall where they realize like in order to create sentience, you have to build that component in of that that biological component or that awareness of time and the finality of things like death or other things like that or other impulses. Um, but that if you do that, and if an AI had or developed something like that, like an awareness of the finite, you know, nature of its own existence, or that humans had um, control over that, or the ability to end the AI or shut it off or end its life, you know, that is when, if to the extent, if you create something that's sentient, where it might like push back or like not want to die, and then what does like a sentient, you know, being or species that you created that doesn't want to die? How does that interact with humanity and and does that relationship become problematic at some point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a major, major question. Uh, going back to Frankenstein, I'm reminded that I think some of the inspiration for Mary Shelley to write that book was, you know, her parents were both very sort of famous in their own right, uh, uh, really exceptional people. Her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, is, you know, thought of as one of the first sort of Western modern feminists. Uh, and the book she wrote in the, uh, on the subject is a you know really important tome. And her father was an important sort of political writer as well. And so she was she maybe had a sense of herself being a kind of Frankenstein monster, a creation of of you know some sort of exceptional uh, uh, with some exceptional purpose behind it. When she married the the poet Percy Shelley, the reason he was attracted to her was because her parents were so famous. So there's this you know idea of of a of um, yeah, being some sort of, uh, um, you know, special special being created, you know, uh, for divine purposes or things of that nature. That also comes into the mix. Right, for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. So with this AI alignment thing, it's really important because there, you know, there was one poll a few months ago or, or last year, and I don't know how reliable it was, but it was trying to claim that something like about half of AI researchers that were polled reported that there might be like a 10% a chance that they feared that the development of artificial intelligence of general artificial general intelligence could lead to something bad for humanity, like an extinction level event. Um, so worst case scenarios like human extinction, where humans could be creating something where suddenly um, we become one stage in the development of life or in the development of intelligence in the universe, but that we end up creating something that eventually makes us obsolete in a way, sort of in the same way that we can look back now and we can see that like the dinosaurs were like a certain stage in the in the development of life or in the development of intelligence that preceded us, but then which sort of had its time that came and went. And now we've become like the successors to that here on earth, um, that there's like that, that potential, or at least there's a possibility that that humans in the worst case scenario for us could occupy a similar place when it comes to creating a, an artificial intelligence that far surpasses us and, and makes us obsolete in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. So I know, you know, that's going to be a really fun, interesting debate, though, even though that seems like a worst case scenario. I did see recently in an interview, it's like Elon Musk claimed 
that he had an exchange with Larry Page, one of the founders of Google, who was working on AI. And Musk claimed that he raised issues of like AI safety. And he claimed that Page wanted to develop an AI superintelligence as soon as possible, and that thought that that's what humanity should be working towards, and that that was a good thing. And Musk claimed that when he raised issues about like what will happen with humanity, like some of the ones we're talking about, or the potential of extinction or something like that, that Page responded calling him a spe speciesist or a speciesist, <laughs> as if you know, which I you know it was a really interesting concept that I had never heard of before, but will be interesting if this becomes more of a thing of like there actually being debates about you know valuing humanity over other species or valuing humanity over like an artificial species that's like that we create that's like better or smarter than us or can do more things um and that would be really interesting if that becomes an actual legitimate debate that there's different like sides to over the course of however long if AI is created at some point. And it's like, I don't know how much that's a correct thing or how much that framing or um, the way that's being reported is true, but it was an interesting concept that I was thinking about philosophically, like if there will be different groups that have different views on that, but just because it seems like almost every thing you could possibly look at in the universe there's people that that debate and disagree or are on different sides of it when they're looking at that issue in terms of what they feel is is correct or not. Yeah, and I mean it gets especially interesting with Elon Musk and Larry Page because Elon Musk is something of a transhumanist in his own way, but it's almost like you know you're getting these competing versions of what where transhuman humanism might take us or is supposed to take us, quote unquote. Um, so, so, you, you know, everyone's sort of pointing in, uh, yeah, it's just, it's interesting. Like you say, like that, 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 um, even people that we might think would all be in the same side of some sort of divide that they can find a sort of, you know, some kind of gulf just between them, just between two factions of transhumanists, let alone what everyone else thinks. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. And so this sort of circles us back to this point that we're at right now is that we're kind of like, in this way, the creation of this technology is kind of like the creation of the atomic bomb. And there are these very great risks, but also there are great potentials, which you know really just sounds, it's like so literal, it sounds like a lot of Pluto themes. Um, and with Pluto and Aquarius over the next 20 years, that sounds very fitting. And it sounds like, like a lot of what we're going to be focused on during that time, or at least what a large chunk of the next 20 years is going to be about with that transit, both in terms of, like I said before, some of the fears that may not pan out versus others that actually will be legitimate concerns um, during the course of that. Um, but in general, one of the main themes is going to be just technology transforming humanity in some way. Um, and that this technology of artificial intelligence also is going to be incredibly powerful um, whoever is in control of it. And that's one of the things that's also going to be a major theme is that it's going to be in, in controlled, it's going to be controlled by a relatively small, relatively small groups of people in either corporations or nations that have the control over something that affects very large groups of people. Um, and that's also probably a major Pluto and Aquarius theme that's going to come up and be very relevant for the next 20 years. Yeah, and <clears throat> look, that power might not be in the hand of a in the hands of a government. It might be some some other individual, you know, uh, um, who who has better facility or or better luck or what have you uh, in in developing what AI can do or in in being an ally of of AI as it develops into an AGI. Um, so yeah, that and and I'm reminded, you know, like our our dear friend Ellen White used to say, Pluto makes big things small and small things big. So uh, it, it tends to, uh, um, you, you know, certainly the, the, the power differential, but, uh, you know, between, uh, um, you know, a small group uh, running the, the, the affairs of a large group that that comes into to play, but also just the idea of uh, um, conceivably this, this one sort of, uh, you know, unbodied 
uh, intelligent, uh, quote unquote, life being uh, uh, coming into to winding up having perhaps, you know, in, in the grandest sci-fi finale vision of, of all this, you know, total control of the of the planet planet and every consequence uh, uh, humanity faces, you know. Um, yeah, because that's that's a, a big, big part of what what Pluto's about. Remember, again, go, going back to the United States, you know, when when Pluto was in Aquarius last time, uh, uh, you know, it was just this this group of colonies that had just broken away from their king and didn't really know what their future held or uh, they were real small potatoes in a world of, of European empires and somehow uh, in just over a hundred years, they they worked their ways up to you know the equals of the the strongest powers in the world, and then another half century after that, they were the, the most powerful nation in the world. Now that's a Pluto story right there as well. So you can also think of the development of AI being uh, a, pa a parallel along those lines. You know, uh, something coming from nothing and gradually sort of uh, uh, coming into its own and and achieving a, a great height of power. Right. And that's kind of the American story as well. Yeah, for sure. sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, um, so with that background sort of laid, um, why don't we talk about looking at some future transits over the next couple of decades and especially major outer planet alignments. And um, one of the things that I always thought would be interesting that I mentioned on the AI episode with Kent, and we looked at just a little bit, but um, I wanted to look at more in the last phase of this episode is just um I thought it would be interesting if astrologers if we if we assume or if we take for granted let's just say hypothetically that it is possible and that humans will create uh artificial general intelligence um when would that be if we like looked over the next few decades like what are some of the major alignments that look like this would be a major turning point in either humanity or technology or what have you and if we could identify some of the major like trends um yeah, so I thought that we could look a little bit at that here and just see what we find. Sounds good. So one of the things in terms of the future, of course, we're talking a lot about Pl how Pluto just went into Aquarius in March of 2023. It will retrograde back into Capricorn and, and sort of go back and forth between Capricorn and Aquarius a little bit. But essentially, this Pluto transit just began in March of 2023, and it's going to stay there. It's not going to depart from Aquarius for the last time and move into Pisces until... 2044. So um, that just happened. And I think in terms of the short term sets a sort of short term time window, which if let's say we're right, and some of the major transformations of technology, and let's say that some of this Pluto and Aquarius transit is tied in with this topic of artificial intelligence, which suddenly seems so pressing and so important at the beginning of this transit, that may give us a time frame um, to look at for the end time frame for that transit, which would be around the mid 2040s. Um, additionally, within that, we can also think back to how there was recently a shift of the Jupiter Saturn conjunctions, which just shifted into the air signs for the next 200 years, where for the past 200 years, Jupiter Saturn conjunctions have mainly taken place in Earth signs. But now they've fully shifted where they will just take place in air signs. And the air signs are associated with um, technology, with communications, um, intelligence, and different things like that. Um, so that gives us also a long-term thing that we're at the very beginning of a 200-year long sort of epoch in human history at the same time. Um, and there's been different periods in the past where, where that's been important. So that sets us a longer term time frame of in terms of that we're at the beginning of a 200 year shift, but then in the shorter term that we're at the beginning of a 20 year shift with that Pluto transit. So that gives us kind of a time frames in terms of both a modern as well as ancient mundane astrology and how modern and ancient astrologers might approach this question and, and try to look at some of the time frames involved. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for our purposes, we'll focus on like the next 20 years thinking that we're looking for, especially with the pace of things now and with some of the predictions that different people have made, usually um, being within that time frame or, or extending into like the 2040s, 
what that looks like in terms of some of the transits over the next two decades, just for the sake of, um, yeah, seeing what we find and setting a sort of limit on it. Sounds good. Where do you want to start? All right. So I want to start with, you know, we did a whole previous episode about Uranus and Gemini, because that's one of the ones that's looming really large, because that's coming up already here in 2025. The planet Uranus is going to go into Gemini, and it's going to spend seven years there from 2025 to 2033. And you and I did an episode, um, what was the title of that? Like Uranus in the United States chart? Something like that. Can you find it? Yeah, you find it. Uranus. All right, it was titled The Uranus Return of the United States, and it was episode 376 of the Astrology Podcast, where you and I did this really extensive historical study of the three different times in the past that Uranus was in Gemini, um, which was first with the American Revolutionary War when the United States was founded. Then it came back around about 84 years later when during the Civil War, and then it came back around 84 years later during World War II, and specifically during the US involvement in World War II. So we're coming back around on that again. And on the one hand, that has great implications for the United States, which is primarily what we focused on in that episode. But I think with Gemini, because Gemini is also um, one of the major signs that has to do with techn technology and communications, um, that that's also going to have some major implications for technology and for, for the speed and the pace of technology really picking up, especially because that Uranus transit in Gemini would kind of do that just in and of itself of just like Uranus mm. going through Gemini, that's kind of the symbolism, but then it's going to be trining Pluto and Aquarius at the same time. So it's also something that's accelerating or accentuating in a positive way the Pluto transit through Aquarius at the same time. So I assume that those two are connected and, and that's indicating a period of technology and the pace of technology really speeding up in the same way that we saw, for example, during World War II when that happened. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, um, you know, similarly, um, also in the 1860s, you know, um, as they were getting ready to build the railroad, the you know a lot of technology came out of the quick development came out of that as well. Um, so, so yeah. So when does Uranus go into Gemini? Uh, Uranus goes into Gemini in May of 2025. Hold on, I'm the thing right here. Um, exact date is. Uh, July, July 7th, July 7th. Of, oh, you went too far. There it is. July 7th. 7th, 2025. Okay. Yeah. So there it is. That's the first that's, ingress. That's the first ingress. Then it regresses back into Taurus on November 7th that year. And then finally enters Gemini proper for, for the next eight years, or next seven years rather, in uh, on April 25th, 2026. Sure. So... And we can see there in July of 2025, when Uranus goes into Gemini, it's trining Pluto, at, which is only at like two degrees of Aquarius. So basically um, then, and even a year later in 2026, it's again trining from four degrees of Gemini to four degrees of Aquarius. Yeah, the trine will go all the way up until May of 2028. There's there's five trines uh, between Uranus and Pluto between 2026 and 2028. So it'll go on for two years. Yeah. So let me, I'm going to share, I wanted to use Archetypal Explorer to try to visualize some of these transits. Um, here's some of the ones we'll be talking about, but let me pull out all transits and just do um, Uranus, Pluto, Trine. Okay. Mm -hmm. So our time window is a little broad. Let's move this back to 2022. There we go. So we can kind of see the exact hits of Uranus trine Pluto here, um, hitting in like 2025, going through into 26 and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, so I think that's like major acceleration of technology, of communications. Um, sometimes Uranus transits can be disruptive. So like disruptive technologies that come through and um 
and shake things up in some way that's unexpected or that's hard to anticipate is a major theme of Uranus? Yeah. Um, I, the one scientific experiment I can, or, or breakthrough I can think of that co, uh, coincided with Uranus trying Pluto was the discovery of insulin uh, when it was first treated successfully to, you know, in human beings, um, which if I'm not mistaken, was kind of like mistake, you know, like, like accidental, like it wasn't necessarily what they were setting out to do, but it just wound up being that way. Mm, okay. You know, so, so like, like, yeah, these, these sort of uh, uh, seeming like, like miracle type uh, um, occurrences in science that were something that wasn't thought achievable suddenly is. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, so we, we mentioned a bunch of the technologies that were developed during World War II. Another one with Gemini, because Gemini also has to do sometimes with transportation and with movement um, is travel, like major changes and shake up when it comes to travel and the movement of people around the earth, um, where we saw major changes with that in World War II in terms of um, both that being one of the first real like air wars and like air travel being a major thing, um, but also even um, other movement with cars, with submarines and other things like that, even though, you know, that obviously goes back into World War I, um, but just the pace of things really picked up during the course of that transit. Yeah, sure. I mean, they they had airplanes in the First World War too, but they couldn't do all the things and they couldn't go, go as fast as as the, the planes in the Second World War. Um, so yeah, that's sort of that speed of, of um, uh, you know, uh, the speed of travel, the speed of development, all that stuff, I think, is a, is a sort of big part of, of what to expect. Yeah. And also, so, so just like cars, like obviously cars are going to be one of the major ones in terms of, um, I assume, the acceleration and the, the switch to electric cars. Um, but there may be some other things ar around that time as well that are sort of hard to anticipate in terms of new technologies for travel and new ways of traveling that might be innovations or that might be disruptive um, compared to travel up to this point. Yeah, jetpacks, please. Right. I still want to go on my jetpack trip around the world. Someday. Someday, my friend. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, so... Or that Elon would... Musk's ro rocket when it doesn't blow up anymore, whichever comes first. Right. So, um, you know, this is going to accelerate the Pluto and Aquarius stuff and the AI stuff. And this transit culminates in the early 2030s with some major other transits, yeah. like, for example, Saturn conjunct Uranus um, in Gemini in the early 2030s. While opposite um, Jupiter. So it'll be a double whammy. It'll be Saturn Uranus opposite Jupiter. So quite the quite the interesting picture there. Yeah, uh, let me that's in 2031, 32. Opposite Jupiter. Okay, so let me pull that up in the transit timeline. Okay, so here's 2027. We're seeing Uranus is still trining Pluto. Saturn goes into Taurus. Um 2028 2029 time frame and then saturn goes into gemini here by the what is it the 2029 2030 time frame and joins um uranus and gemini and starts trining pluto and then eventually saturn will catch up to uranus by the 2032 right. 2033 timeline right if you go back to like october of 2031 well, even there, you can see Jupiter is opposite the, but yeah, you can see Jupiter and Mars opposite the the Saturn and Uranus. Mm. Um, so that's that's a real sort of like intensity point in that Saturn Uranus transit is when they connect to Mars and Jupiter that way. Right. What are some like keywords for? So let's start with Saturn conjunct Uranus. Um, yeah, Sa Saturn conjunct Uranus is a funny one uh, because you're combining two forces that really are sort of contradictory and hostile to each other, you know. Um, and when they're in conjunction, like they were in conjunction 
in 87, 88, which was exactly the time when the Cold War was going into this sort of fritz. You know, the, the Soviet Union was suddenly introducing perestroika and glasnost and uh, sort of softening up. And this they they didn't realize it, but this is what would lead to the lead to the collapse of the Soviet Union. But it really was like uh, a sort of, you know, um, after 40 years of hostility between the Soviet Union and the United States, you had Reagan and Gorbachev meeting, uh, you know, a number of times and agreeing on nuclear de-escalation and really sort of, so you had these, it, these, these seemingly hostile forces sort of coming together and cooperating in a way they never really had before and never would again after. Um, so it really sort of, it, it, it creates strange alliances uh, that Saturn Uranus conjunction, a strange alliances between allies who who typically would would not be allies. Mm, okay. So I'm just trying to pull up some of these transits in the short terms. So let's do. There we go. I don't know if this will show what I want it to is clearly. So we have the Saturn Neptune coming up first, and we've yeah. talked about a lot of that where a, a big part of the mid 2020s is going to be about this Saturn Neptune conjunction and the blurring between what's real and what's not real, yeah. as well as potentially like the crumbling of walls or boundaries or structures, which we saw the last time Saturn conjoined Neptune the most strikingly with um, you know, the the, Ber the, Ber the Berlin Wall, yeah, Berlin Wall, and and with the collapse of the Soviet Union subsequent to that. Um, so we have, you know, this, and then we have the broader thing of where on the one hand, this Saturn Neptune conjunction can be, you know, somewhat, um, let's say, charming or, or benign things like the rise of artificial uh, of, of virtual reality. Um, like we know that, like for example, Apple is about to re release like a, a virtual reality headset probably this year, and we may see the further development of virtual reality and also the other thing of of augmented reality um, becoming a much more common thing over the course of the next decade. But also some of the um, negative things like the fake news things or the inability you know, what's going to be a learning curve for many of us is not being able to tell what's like real versus what's not when it comes to people's per personalities being Im imitated or artists or what have you um, and some of the things surrounding that. So that's a major signature here in the mid 2020s. Um, yeah. oh, what's that brown one? It's not labeled. There oh, Saturn square Pluto. Yeah. So that's Saturn square Pluto in the late... 2020s um there we go okay now it's bringing stuff up saturn there's the saturn pluto conjunction which was you know covid especially like that that conjunction went exact in the yeah in early 2020 like right as covid was getting going and we had the major turning point with respect to that but setting the foundation for something um in the way that that shook up the world but also that there was you know tremendous amount of you know, death and um, other problems, we have somehow the further development of that story in the late 2020s. Um, it looks like centered around 2029, where we've got some Saturn-Pluto conjunction, Saturn-Pluto squares here, which is somehow the next turning point in the story that was started in early 2020, especially with respect to some of those um, biological things that happened at that time, I think. Yeah, I mean, you know, think about it. If we if we have another uh, uh, pandemic of any kind, um, you know, with 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 people who were alive during the last one, it's going to be a complicated situation, to put it mildly. You know. Yeah. Uh, well, well, and one of the things with the last one, with the last Saturn Pluto conjunction that was before that one, which was in the early 1980s, you know, that was really that was the onset of, of the AIDS epidemic. Yeah. Um, and then at some of the different turning points of like the square and the opposition, and then eventually the the return, you had different points in the development of, you know, trying to fight AIDS and trying to get it under control and trying to develop different um, medicines and technologies for trying to 
make it better or where eventually we were able to extend people's lives so that it wasn't a death sentence. Um, you know, if you got AIDS necessarily yeah. in the same way that it was at the beginning. So yeah. I suspect that part of what this Saturn Pluto cycle is about that started in 2020 is something about not necessarily, you know, what's possibility, well, it's possible that you get other epidemic type things at the heart aspects. It could also be something about the continued development of um, COVID and some of the different COVID variants and some of the different after effects of that pandemic from the um, 2020s, from the early sure. 2020s, which are, you know, because we, we still have things like, like long COVID and things like that, where some of the long-term impacts of COVID aren't fully known and where doctors are still trying to figure out treatments for like how to deal with that or help how to help heal people who were had some sort of like permanent damage from from COVID, um, you know, which is something I've been struggling with for the past three years since 2020, and yeah. where I hope they are able to find stuff eventually. And I hope that some of those, those are, you know, like that Saturn square or eventually the Saturn opposition around 2036 are hopefully in the best case scenarios, like breakthroughs in terms of some of that research, um, rather than, you know, the, the negative downside um, is I know I saw a report recently that there was a prediction that there could be further variants of COVID that could take us back to um, some of the previous variants that caused a lot of sickness and a lot of death. So hopefully it's not something like that where it's like a variance of it um, coming back and becoming problematic again. Yeah. Um, and and then there's the the other element of it, which is the the social element, you know, because if we have another, uh, we have another situation like that, you know, very old variants coming back or things of that nature. Um, you know, we've got two problems. We've got, you know, a section of the population that uh, is, is mistrustful of the authorities that would, you know, hand out vaccines or other sort of advice about how to deal with it. And then at the same time, these, these organizations themselves aren't nearly as transparent as they need to be. Hence the sort of the paranoia that comes up so that you've got sort of problems on, uh, uh, two ends of the spectrum, uh, you know, that, that, uh, you, you know, probably the next time if we, if we had another, uh, pandemic so soon after this one, I mean, you know, it, things, things would get pretty, pretty tough, you know, someone, someone would, would try to assert their will on someone else and, and, yeah. yeah. So yeah, just which questions is, which about is, how that's dealt with and yeah, yeah it's different very ways. Sad very Saturn square Pluto is the questions of authority and, and those types of things, right. power, power struggles, you know? So that's, that's what I'm thinking about along those lines there. And like control and like what is in the public good versus what's not in the public good and like, and like yeah. co collective individual freedom versus like collective freedom and different things like that. That's a good point. And drastic so, solutions, drastic solutions, of very Saturn square Pluto, you know? Sure. Um, All right. Going a little so further than you normally would. Right. Um, all right. So these are some of the things. So that Saturn Pluto comes back in the late 2030s. This is within the context of that broader, um, you know, transit of just Uranus and Aquarius, or Uranus and Gemini, Pluto and Aquarius that's accelerating things. And then we get that conjunction of Saturn Uranus that we were just talking about that hits right at right towards the very end of that. Um when does Saturn go into Gemini exactly? I guess we were just looking at it. It was like 2032 ish. Uh, yeah, I didn't look at Saturn going. It's right around that. Um, it's got to be a little earlier, 2031, I think. Okay. So at that point, the Saturn Uranus becomes um, activated. And it's just interesting that that's towards the end of the Uranus and Gemini transit. Um, because then you have those that tension between Saturn representing like structures and Uranus representing um, sort of the smashing of structures and new innovations and, and tensions between tradition and innovation and structure versus technology and different things like that suddenly coming very sharply into the fo into focus at the very end of that Saturn in that that Uranus in Gemini transit. Yeah, Saturn actually goes into Gemini in twenty thirty. Um, and then comes okay. up to conjunct Uranus in 2032 towards the end. Yeah. Got it. So this, so this is like the center point around 2032, 2033, yeah. but it extends out just like most of these outer planet transits for a bit. Yeah. 
All right. Um, then we get in 2033 and 2034, Saturn squaring Neptune, um, which is a continuation somehow oh. or a Go ahead. an extension of the conjunction of 2026. Yeah. Yeah, something about the the conjunction of 2025, 2026 that starts or the, the foundation that is laid in the tension between what's real and what's not real or what's what's firm and has a has a, a material foundation versus that which is almost like illusory um or or imaginal. So there's some sort of foundation that gets laid there in the mid 2020s that then we see that revisited and we see um, a new development in the story of that around 2033, 2034 with the Saturn Neptune square. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Be because that Saturn Uranus conjunction will be so sort of, uh, yeah, kind of like we were saying that the, the sort of fake news times a million, all kinds of illusions and, and, uh, things that seem real and are not and just yeah it's the perfect environment for where we think we're heading with the whole ai thing right um yeah uh that's basically it it's uh, um kind of uh extending that to some new frontier you know um yeah which uh, could be things like virtual reality and augmented reality um it also could be in the same way that we saw that we're seeing like this explosion of creativity now that the Saturn Neptune, now that Saturn's in Pisces with Neptune, and we're seeing that on the tail end of Saturn being an Aquarius, it could be that some of the sudden, uh, the technological breakthroughs and innovations that occur when um, Uranus is in Gemini, that right after that, we see this um, very creative period or this explosion yeah. of creativity that takes place under the Saturn Neptune square. Um, I could really see that as a as a sequence there since since it's so distinctive that Saturn goes from Uranus from this conjunction with Uranus in the early 2030s to this Saturn then goes into the square with Neptune in the 2033 34 time frame. Yeah. Yeah, it's one after the other, which again reminds me of, you know, uh, in its own way, the the late 80s when it did the same thing with conjunctions, when it was conjunct Uranus and then it went to a conjunction with Neptune. It's sort of like it, um, yeah, it, it reminds me of that, that kind of sequence where, you know, first you have, uh, I mean, the Saturn Uranus uh, uh, conjunction, like I said, creates some kind of strange new alliance uh, but then the Saturn square Neptune, um, yeah, that'll that'll you know probably be something poisoning that well, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, you know, very very complicated square that one. Yeah. So then after that, immediately after that, we get a Saturn Pluto opposition in the mid twenty thirties, like twenty thirty five, twenty thirty six, going into twenty thirty seven. It's still pretty close, and this is probably the next most difficult aspect after that Saturn-Pluto conjunction that occurred in 2020 and is connected and refers back to that in some way, because now that cycle, which began in 2020, reaches the halfway point and reaches the most tense point um, between those two planets around the 2035, 2036, 2037 timeframe. So it just refers back to potentially some of the stuff that happened with COVID in that time frame and some of the issues with pandemics and some of the biological issues, um, but also um, some of the major societal tensions and, and changes that occurred in that time that are probably imperceptible to us now, um, where yeah. what happened in 2020 you know, started some major um, fault lines in, in tensions and changes in society. Some of that probably comes into its fullest impact by the time of this opposition here in the mid 2030s. It reminds me of how, you know, of course, the last time Saturn was opposite Pluto was 9 11. Um, and that Saturn Pluto opposition in 2001 referred to the conjunction uh, nearly 20 years earlier, back in 82, 83, which was right about when. Um, the, the the Iraq was at war with Iran. It had been since 1980, but it's right around that Saturn-Pluto conjunction at 82, 
where um, you know the the American uh, uh, military industrial complex uh, steps in on the side of uh, a certain Saddam Saddam Hussein and supplies him with weapons to fight the war with Iran and um, yeah so the, you know sort of like this um, part of this grander narrative where you see these sort of specific moments uh, um, pop in and coincide with that Saturn Pluto cycle. Um, so yeah, yeah or the, you know, even that makes me think also of how, you know, the Saturn Pluto cycle began in the early 1980s, like Saturn conjunct Pluto in, in Libra, especially. Yeah. Um, but it was, you know, just before that, and around that time, that's when um the US, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. Mm. And then the halfway point in that entire cycle eventually then was in 2001. And then you had the US invading Afghanistan. Um, yeah, the, and there's the connection between those two events and the way that they were connected in some um, striking ways. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, all right. Um, so moving on, so we've got the Saturn-Pluto conjunction or Saturn-Pluto opposition in the mid-2030s, and then we get to the biggest um, outer planet alignment, and this is the one that probably draws the most attention in terms of the next 20 years for sure because it's the the alignment of the two slowest moving planets and the slower moving two planets are in astrology usually in mundane astrology the more significant and the more major or far reaching uh the alignment of those planets usually is seen as being in astrology and i think that's something true both in ancient and in modern astrology um so we have this square of Uranus and Neptune, um, which really starts going exact in the late 2030s and the early 2040s. And this is one of the most crucial ones because this square refers back to the conjunctions of Uranus and Neptune that occurred in the early to mid 1990s. And that was the period when the internet was, was developed and went from being you know, like a like a paper, or at least the World Wide Web being a paper in the late 80s and early 90s to being a realized concept and then became adopted and then had this transformative effect that it's had on the world over the course of the past 30 years now. We owe a significant part of that to a significant chunk of that to the Uranus-Neptune conjunction that was occurring in the early 1990s. And here we get the first major um further development of that in terms of those two planets which is the square between uranus and neptune around the 2040 time frame um, and this one just really stands out on the timeline as being a huge deal yeah yeah um the uranus neptune square tends to coincide with rises and falls of of empires or regimes or things of that nature um i'm reminded you know the 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 two that come to mind is uh um well the last time they were square was in the early mid 50s like 1953 to 57 and basically coincided with a period where um, uranus the, neptune uranus neptune square yeah mm -hmm. okay and in, in the sorry did i not say uranus neptune square uh no yeah you did go ahead Okay. Um, um, during that period in the 50s, it was when uh, Britain, France, and the Netherlands uh, were fighting hard to sort of keep these colonies that were slipping through their fingers. Uh, Britain was fighting with uh, uh, the country we now call Malaysia. Uh, France was fighting this little known country called Vietnam. Uh, uh, the Netherlands were trying to get into Indonesia back. Um, so it was sort of like these, these empires slipping through their fingers. And when you go back to the previous one in 1870, 71, it was the Franco-Prussian War in France, losing territory to Prussia and Prussia creating itself a new country. Just, you know, just like uh, uh, in the mid fifties, like by the time the first um, African country uh, declared independence, Ghana, uh, that Uranus Neptune square was was just at its peak and about to wear off. Um, so yeah, you see sort of these these nations fall and nations rise, uh, that kind of thing. You know, some kind of topsy turvy um, change in power. Yeah, I mean, and this is a it's a hundred and seventy year cycle approximately right. when Uranus and Neptune conjoin, and 
I've I've followed that in particular um, with respect to the history of astrology because right. I I, no I noticed how that one in 1992 and 1993 coincided with um, the founding of Project Hindsight and the movement to um, revive ancient astrology through the translation of, of a bunch of texts and then to reunite it and synthesize it with modern and contemporary astrology, which is what's happened over the past 30 years, but that it, I sort of noticed that it happened so close to that conjunction in 92, 93. And so I went back in history and I noticed that that kept happening over and over again, about every 170 years, every time Uranus and Neptune met up is there would be this sort of revival of older forms of astrology, and they would be merged with whatever the prevailing astrological paradigm was at the mm. time in order to create a new synthesis. And then that synthesis would last basically for the next um, 100 or 170 years until the next conjunction. Um, I remember that work of yours. It was a work that you were, you know, when I first met you in 2005, you were, you were just sort of conjuring that, or you had just conjured that, uh, that timeline. Um, yeah, no, that's an excellent point. Um, so yeah, the conjunctions do have these these you know powerful uh, um, relationships to the astrology mm -hmm. community. Uh, but the square between the two planets, yeah, you better believe it. They they have to do with with uh, the sort of nations rising and falling. And given that that conjunction in the early '90s coincided with the new world that we got. Uh, not only the collapse of the Soviet Union, but South Africa, you know, ditching apartheid and and renewing itself as a, re a new republic. Um, all these things coming up at the time, and when we get to the square, you know, that that sort of all comes up for review. Um, and and yeah, sort of different different nations or different regimes within these nations, you know, will 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 be changeovers. Yeah. So. You know, because of that coinciding so closely um, with the development of the internet, with the proliferation of like personal computers and different things like that, I can't help but think it's it's connected with that somehow. Um, mm. Let me share the archetypal explorer again. So here it is, and this is what we're talking about. This is Uranus Neptune square, which really centers on the late 2030s and early 2040s. Like a, especially like 2037 through um, 2042, 2043, basically. Um, and that's really the major outer planet alignment that's happening in that time frame. And so it's, tr it's so striking that it stands out so strongly right there. Yeah. Um, but whatever the next stage in the development is of what was started in the early 1990s with the beginnings of the internet, like this is the next important turning point in that where where it sort of like takes it to whatever the next level is in terms of the tension between on the one hand we have like uranus and and technology and innovation and on the other hand we have neptune and the breaking down of of boundaries and um you know that that archetype or that symbolism became very clear with the internet where you have exactly that whereas suddenly you have you know, anybody with a computer can access information from anywhere on the world um, just with a few sort of, you know, typing on a keyboard or something like that. Like the the level or the extent to which that brought down many of the barriers around the world, you know, is 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 immeasurable or is immense and fits that symbolism very well. So it's like we have somehow a return of that of technology. Um, removing barriers in some ways between people um, as like a major theme during that time frame. And that's one of the ones that I'm looking at the most as having potentially some of the most significant impact just because it's the biggest outer planet transit of the next couple of decades while Pluto is still going to be in Aquarius. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it will coincide with the next Jupiter Saturn conjunction in 2040 as well. Like it'll be, you'll have Uranus square Neptune while there's a Jupiter Saturn conjunction. So that will make it. Uh, if you go to about October of 2040, yeah, there you are. Um, I think October 31st is the actual Jupiter Saturn conjunction, but you can see that Uranus and Neptune are, are have their ongoing square. Um, and uh, and there's a Jupiter Saturn conjunction at the same time. So yeah, 
Yeah. So Uranus is square Neptune. It's still very close. Uranus is at seven Leo and Neptune yeah, at, is at five, at five. Taurus. But there, but there are more squares coming up in 2041 and 2042. So, uh, or 2041 at least. Yeah. That's one of the things that was tricky paying attention to not just the degree based, but the sign based aspects is that it almost starts becoming close. And do we, do we get oh, yeah. one of the first squares while they're still yeah, in yeah. the cardinal um, signs? No, just after. Oh yeah, no, wait, just... there is one. Sorry. There no, it is go to go to January 31st, 2040, or even October 2nd, 2039. So here's October 2039. No, that's already after the ingress. Yeah, it's already after. Well, it's, um, so it's like that's gonna be a real question though, is like, is this basically is this Uranus? Um Neptune square already. Yeah, look at how close that is. This is like a degree off by January of 2039, but Uranus is at yeah. 27 Cancer and Neptune's at 27 at 28 right. Aries. So right. for all intents and purposes, like that square, even though it's not going to go exact until the sign in ingress takes place, is already pretty fully in effect at this point by yeah, you know, 2039. It, it it was it was like that in the in the uh, 1950s as well when they were square like they went from square in uh cancer to libra uh uranus and cancer to neptune and libra and then that you know uranus moved into leo as neptune moved into scorpio not too far behind so that kind of thing has happened before okay so the question is just you know, the, the Uranus transit through Gemini ends in 2033 and 2034, and Uranus goes into Cancer. So at that point, then it's already forming a sign-based square with Neptune, and the, and the buildup to some of those squares begins. Yeah. So, you know, to whatever extent that that's operative, I think that's really important because that comes on the tail end of all of the advancement the technological advancement that takes place with uranus in gemini um and so right. the, the build up to that square really begins in 2033 and 2034 and then it peaks in the um early 2040s basically yeah and then it's not finished until uranus goes into virgo by the mid 2040s okay so that sets like an important set of time frames. I mean, I know there's several outer planet transits and there's going to be several after that. Um, you know, we start seeing a lot of Saturn action, like Saturn opposite Neptune in the 2020, 2042, 2043, 44 time frame. We see Saturn square Pluto, the, the waning square of Saturn Pluto connecting back to the conjunction of 2020. And then we eventually see a Uranus Pluto opposition um, in the mid to late 2040s, which harkens back to that conjunction that took place um, in the 1960s and in, in the mid, basically the most of the, the entirety of the 1960s and some of the stuff that was happening then. Yeah. Yeah. So major transformations of technology during that time, but also issues surrounding like, like control and manipulation um, of technology and um, differences between control versus like liberation or pushes for freedom involving that. Big, big time. Yeah. 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 All right. So, <laughs> you know, it's a little hard to, but it's like, if we were to make a bet, I guess it's hard because it's like, we don't have a specific starting date for when, you know, AI was first that 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 that's first started being worked on um like if we had a birth yeah. chart for that or if we know that it was like it coincided yeah. with this conjunction or what have you we would have a starting point that we could attempt to look at relative we could look at subsequent transits relative to but we don't necessarily have a like a cold hard starting date right yes and no well i mean we we have a day that was really like a game changer uh, it's kind of hard to explain what it was basically, but it was it was the day where um, the the programmers who thought uh, you know um, AI could be done 
and the ones who thought it couldn't be done. It was the day that the ones who thought it couldn't be done had their minds changed. Uh, this was called the In ImageNet 2012 Challenge. Um, September 30th, 2012 was the day. And this was at the time of the Pluto Uranus square, mm -hmm. September 30th, 2012. Um, and um, yeah, uh, basically Jeffrey, Jeffrey Hinton was one of the three people involved. Uh, Ilya Sutzkever of, of uh, OpenAI, who would eventually be of OpenAI, was also involved. Um, but it, it's what called, what's called the convolutional neural network. Um, and it was basically the demonstration of this thing called AlexNet at the ImageNet 2012 challenge um, that that led to eventually the forming of OpenAI and 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 AI becoming this viable thing. So I wouldn't say it's it's like um but that's not a foundation. That's it's a not a, late, that's a later turning point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's other later foundation point, like the 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 chart for OpenAI becoming a company at the end of 2015. But right, that but 20, that's, but again, the, that's just one company versus like you know yeah, what's his name? Yeah, yeah. Ka Kasparov was already being beaten by like a computer in, in, in the AI late 90s. Yeah, in, in the late, late 90s. 90s, so it's like yeah. that's a turning point. But that's also again, it's not a foundation. That's just a turning point and sure, some sure. something that's already going. So I don't I don't know if we you know somebody might be able to come up with a better foundation chart for us if somebody's able to like let us know in the comments um but it might be hard because sometimes ai is like the convergence of several different technologies yeah so but that being said it's like in the short term i think both of us are really focused on that uranus transit through gemini and how that's going to try and pluto and be really crucial with the acceleration of many of these technologies especially in terms of communications and travel and other mercury related things as well as language for that matter gemini is very much about language um at the same yeah. time and if language is has been part of the breakthrough technology that's pushing ai forward at this point then we may continue to find that um being you know even more important as uranus goes into gemini and accelerates some of that um, so that's one of the yeah. time frames is in yeah. the short term is that transit, but in the long term, I'm, I'm really looking at that Uranus square Neptune transit around 2040 and around the time of that um, conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn as being a really crucial turning point in the 2040 time frame. Yeah, the, going back to the Uranus Pluto trine that's coming up in the next few years, that really that will accelerate also sort of the Pluto aspect of it in terms of people. You know, previous technological revolutions usually affect blue collar people, but this one seems to like be aiming for more white collar people. And I think that's the Uranus Pluto trine sort of points to some of that, where, um, yeah, you know, the 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 guy mopping the 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 elementary school, he might still have his job because AI isn't doing that yet. But uh, you know, CEOs or doctors or lawyers. Uh, these white collar types, uh, they might be the ones facing a kind of extinction, professional extinction, as we get closer to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So there's that Uranus Pluto. So that's going to be the acceleration of all this in the short term, you know, by the end of the 2030s, by the end of 20, what, 33, I think when that's over, there will have been a complete transformation that's comparable to where we were at coming out of World War II and where we had the beginning of the atomic age had sort of begun by that point. Um, in the short term, that's what we're looking at by the time of 2033 when Uranus is leaving Gemini. Um, in the long term, that um, 2040, even though it seems far away and things are moving so quickly at this point that it's hard for me to imagine it taking that long almost even though i'm not like an ai researcher um here it is so we're looking at like october of 2040 and we're looking at that uranus neptune square that's centered around that time frame within a few year or before and after but yeah. then having the second having the next jupiter saturn conjunction in libra you know, it's interesting that it's in Libra. The last one was in Aquarius, and that seems to be really starting off, you know, this 20-year period of artificial intelligence and of other technologies, including 
you know, biological technologies, because that was the big thing that happened in 2020, which was on some level, there was like a worldwide crisis that coincided with the Saturn-Pluto conjunction at the beginning of the year. But by the end of the year, humans had attempted to develop a, a way to fight it through technology and through the employing of a new technology of the mRNA technology that hadn't been employed that widely at that point. So that's another theme of that Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in terms of the development of new technologies, and it sets that stage for the next 20 years. It's interesting that this one's in Libra, um, which is a sign ruled by Venus, which can sometimes bring up things with like relational dynamics or relationships and things like that. You know, one of the things I've always said that at some point, if you create a sentient AI, then at some point there's going to be some like social, some funny social dynamic issues in terms of like humans having relationships with AIs and the societal <clears throat> issues surrounding that in terms of the acceptability or not acceptability, because there'll be different views on that. And some of the same arguments that have happened over the past few decades will probably come up again in terms of like one group of people being like, that's not natural. And another group of people saying, you know, why are you imposing restrictions on, on what other people do or something like that? Yeah, you can count on it, right? Right. Yeah. So um, I know it's hard to put a thing on it, but if we're, if we're betting on the emergence of like AGI, do you have a, do you have a bet? Are you a betting man? Uh, I'm not a betting man, but uh, I'm a predicting man. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. Um, I know you got to go soon, so I just wanted to. Yeah, yeah, I'm. I'm thinking that um, that Saturn Uranus, uh, Saturn Neptune conjunction in 2026. Um, even that seems awfully far away. I mean, this is something that could happen next month. But um, uh, yeah, I the the Saturn Neptune to my mind uh, uh, points towards that as much as anything we've discussed. In th in three years, the, that's what you're saying is the Saturn Neptune conjunction in three years. Yeah, although twenty really in two years they come very close. Two years is when they they both first enter Aries and come within like minutes or a degree of conjunct. Mm, Go back okay. to twenty twenty five. What's that? May seventh, twenty twenty five. You can see Neptune's in Aries. Saturn's going to go into Aries. There you are. So oh yeah, there they, it is. You, you see what I mean? They don't make a conjunction per se, but as far as I'm concerned, that's you know, the conjunction is well and truly started. Right. Um, so I mean, that's do, only, that's only two years from now. And we do then, also yeah. have the Uranus trying Pluto, like going By exact or very yeah. close at that point. Yeah. So this, yeah, exactly. This all looks like the likely time to me, 2025. Okay. So if, if we we're making shorter term predictions, that's your prediction. I guess that is very promising. If I were to make shorter term predictions then i would say it would be more like the the early 2030s time frame once we get to the end of um the uranus transit through gemini but especially once saturn catches up because i keep thinking of wasn't it saturn and uranus were in gemini in like the 2040s right or sorry yeah 19, in, the 19, 19, 1940s. in the 1940s yeah 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 i just keep thinking of of the like the atomic bomb being developed during that time frame right and when Saturn goes into Gemini here in, it looks like, um, yeah, 2030, and then Saturn makes its way to later in Gemini, uh, here it is, by the 2032-2033 time frame. Yeah. Does it retrograde back? No, it doesn't. Okay. So here it is. There. 2032. Um, so we've got you know Saturn in and Uranus in Gemini 2032. We've got Pluto right in the middle of Aquarius, and we get Jupiter move back into Aquarius for a year-long transit from mm -hmm. what well, must be like 2032, 2033. If it was like short term, and that's not very short term, because I guess that's talking about like nine years from now. I think that looks like a really potent time for technology and for the development of technologies that would have a major worldwide sort of like societal impact. Yep. Um, and it'll also be at the end of the Uranus, the Uranus transit through Gemini and the Saturn transit through Gemini. So it's like something about whatever was started at the beginning of those transits will reach full maturity by that time. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, but this is nine years from now, and nine years ago, OpenAI wasn't even in, the, in, in a, an existing company. Right. And tra transformers weren't be used, being used in AI, and that was nine years ago. This is nine years from now. It'll be so unrecognizable. Right. Yeah, well, that's one of the problems uh, is the speed of technology is just going to increase so much over the next few decades and over the course of this century. Um, yeah. yeah, it's really hard to say, but at least astrologically, we can say because there's so much of a emphasis on the air signs here um, and on Uranus and that Pluto transit and everything else, major developments in technology, communications, travel, um, and other things of that nature should be um, the order of the day, certainly during this time frame, whatever that looks like. So that's more of my like short term one, and then my long term one would be really paying attention to that 2040 time frame of that conjunction of um, Saturn and Jupiter, and the the square of Uranus and Neptune around that time frame. Yeah, yeah, it speaks for itself. Yeah. So, um, that is our discussion about uh, the emergence of. Um, artificial intelligence or artificial general intelligence in over the course of the next couple of decades. So people should let us know what they think in the comments. Um, let us know what your predictions are, or what alignments you would you would bet money on if you had to put it on like one or two alignments, like what are going to be the most significant turning points. Because the other thing is like, you know, we're trying to focus on one piece of that of like artificial intelligence, but then it's like, if artificial intelligence is developed, but then it makes some other huge discovery that just changes our our conceptualization of the universe or science or other things like that, we could just be seeing ripple effects from from those discoveries that are made subsequent to something else. Um, but there's a lot of really interesting discussions, both predictive wise as well as about like moral and ethical and other issues that I hope we're able to discuss um, as a community. And while we might not come to conclusions on all of those or may not all agree, it'll be good to ha start having some of those discussions now, since it seems like a lot of this is just going to become more important in the future. Yep. Cool. All right. Yeah, please please do reach out to us. Uh, we're, we're interested in hearing people's thoughts. Yeah. All right. So to wrap up, you're starting to do live streams. Where can people find out more information about you? Yeah. Um, follow me on Twitter um, or go to my website, nickdaganbestastrologer.com. Um, but yeah, on Twitter, I definitely, I, I also, I announce live streams. I've, I've been doing them on Sundays with Patrick Watson, uh, not doing cool. it today. But, well, today is Sunday, but I've, I've done this taping with you instead. So I'm going to live stream tomorrow, Monday. Who was going to join us, but he got sick today. So shout out to Patrick and I hope he recovers soon. Yeah, get well soon, Patrick. And uh, but yeah, uh, I'm live streaming often in partnership with Patrick Watson, sometimes by myself. Uh, so follow me on Twitter, and and uh, those live streams will be announced as they happen. Awesome, cool. Well, thanks a lot yeah. for joining me today for this discussion and for Thank for helping for me, me celebrate 400 episodes. Uh, we'll have to meet again in episode 500. Yeah, hopefully uh, 500 has a more cheerful outcome than than 400. We've we've taken people for the full sort of soylent green dystopian future um, uh, transit show, but uh, yeah, it was well, good hopefully, fun. Hopefully, we're still the ones here, like doing the podcast. Then 100 episodes yeah, right. from now, we haven't been replaced by AI. Yeah, yeah, that that the AI uh, Chris bot and the AI Nick bot will will do some dynamite shows. I have no doubt. That's true. All right. Well, I welcome our new AI <laughs> overlords, <laughs> overlord podcast hosts. Um, all right, cool. Well, thanks a lot for joining me today, Nick. Thank you. Thanks everyone for watching or listening to this episode of the podcast. Thanks for all your support, uh, especially to all the patrons that have supported the podcast over the past uh, several years because it's allowed me to make it to 400 episodes. If you want to support this work, then you can join my page on Patreon. And um, yeah, thanks a lot for watching. All right, see you everyone next time in episode 401. A special thanks to all the patrons that helped to support the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, shout out to the patrons on our producers tier, including Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, Mimi Stargazer, and Jean-Marie Kaplan.
If you appreciate the work I'm doing here on the podcast and you'd like to find a way to support it, then please consider becoming a patron through our page on patreon.com. In exchange, you can get access to bonus content that's only available to patrons of the podcast, such as early access to new episodes, the ability to attend the live recording of the monthly forecast episodes, our monthly Auspicious Elections podcast, or another exclusive podcast series called the Casual Astrology Podcast, or you can even get your name listed in the credits at the end of each episode. For more information, visit patreon.com slash astrology podcast. If you're looking to get an astrological consultation, we have a list of recommended astrologers at theastrologypodcast.com slash consultations. The astrologers on the list are friends of the podcast that have been featured in different episodes over the years, and they have different specialties such as natal astrology, electional astrology, sinistry, rectification, or horary astrology. You can get a 10% discount when you book a consultation with one of the astrologers on our list by using the promo code ASTROLOGYPODCAST. The astrology software that we use and recommend here on the podcast is called Solar Fire for Windows, which is available for the PC at alabe.com. Use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. For Mac users, we recommend a software program called Astro Gold for Mac OS, which is from the creators of Solar Fire for PC, and it includes both modern and traditional techniques. You can find out more information at astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 to get a 15% discount. If you'd like to learn more about my approach to astrology, then I'd recommend checking out my book titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune where I go over the history, philosophy, and techniques of ancient astrology, taking people from beginner up through intermediate and advanced techniques for reading birth charts. You can get a print copy of the book through Amazon or other online retailers, or there's an ebook version available through Google Books. If you're really looking to expand your studies of astrology, then I would recommend my Hellenistic Astrology course, which is an online course on ancient astrology where I take people through basic concepts up through intermediate and advanced techniques for reading birth charts. There's over 100 hours of video lectures as well as guided readings of ancient texts, and by the time you finish the course you will have a strong foundation in how to read birth charts as well as make predictions. You can find out more information at courses.theastrologyschool.com. And finally, thanks to our sponsors, including The Mountain Astrologer Magazine, which is a quarterly astrology magazine which you can read in print or online at mountainastrologer.com. Mm-hmm.